Welcome to the Restoration Activation Project video series. Hi, Mary Ann here and thanks for joining me. A few months ago, I participated in an important panel discussion with James Bartley, Eve Lorgan, Laura Matsu, and Kelsey Ray on the topic of toxic feminism and divine goddess programming. If you haven't already watched it, I encourage you to do so as it directly ties to the topic of this episode toxic masculine programming and I've provided a link below this video so that you can go check it out for yourselves. Today I am joined by my very special guests and dear colleagues Eve Lorgan, James Bartley, and Bernhard Gunther. Our intention today generally speaking is to provide an informative counterbalance to the toxic feminism panel discussion that helps educate and perhaps even inspires and empowers more men to take whatever steps they need to take in order to help advance the raising and progression of consciousness. In other words, activating and co-creationally aligning with their spiritual warrior faculties during these very tumultuous times that we find ourselves in, rather than making co-creational choices that run counter to that. Welcome to all of you and thank you for participating today. For viewers, who might not be familiar with you, would you each please take just a minute to introduce yourselves, beginning with you, James. <clears throat> Thank you, Marianne. My name is James Bartley. My website is thecosmicswitchboardshow.com, rather thecosmicswitchboard.com. <laughs> and I've been in the field for, for some time now. I've had my own alien abduction encounters and I've had uh, some military abduction encounters and I've been researching in the field for a while. So th this is quite an honor to be on this panel with, with such a great group of people. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to take part in, in this and, you know, talk about the toxic masculine because we're seeing more and more manifestations of this going forward. Uh, it, it's a part of the, uh, the psyche that's been tapped into for manipulation, our contact purposes at this critical time. So we definitely need to discuss this. Thanks, James, and we're honored to have you. Evie. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's, it's so great to, to be on this panel. And um, I guess I can say along with James that I've been in this field of research as well as um, the same kind of things that James started. We actually did our research together over 25 years ago with uh, alien abduction military abductions, the conspiracies surrounding UFO phenomena and, you know, the paranormal and then everything that kind of goes along with that, which has to do a lot with um, what I call anomalous trauma, which is my specialty. And within anomalous trauma, I'm able to basically assess what kind of dysfunctional things are going on interpersonally in relationships and individually. So I think it will be relevant with, with what I know. And um, I'm just really happy to join you. And um, we'll just, I'll just share as we go along with the questions. Um, my website is uh, alienlovebite.com as well as evelorgan.com. And uh, I also have a Facebook page that's Alien Love Bite. It's a private Facebook group as well. Excellent. Thanks, Evie. And we're glad you're here. <laughs> Bernard. All right. Hey, y'all. Thank you again, Marianne, for uh, organizing this panel. And it feels a bit like a little reunion with Evie and uh, James. Well, I, I think it was three or four years ago, we did a Love Bite panel, a long one, along with Tom Montag and the Hyperdimensional Interference one. So it feels really great to be on there. And yeah, I, my website is Piercing the Veil of Reality. You can find it at veilofreality.com. And you know, I've been in this field like for this path, so to speak, for well over two decades. And uh, I also have a podcast with my wife, Laura, Laura Matsu. She was on the Toxic Feminine uh, webinar you guys did. And we have a podcast together, the Cosmic Matrix podcast. And yeah, um, just really like looking forward to dive into this topic. As you said, Mary, and it's very much needed in this day and age with what's happening because it ties into the warrior archetype, it ties into the embodiment process and many other things. So I'm looking forward to explore this topic on multidimensional levels from a psychological trauma, wounding perspective, from a hyperdimensional occult perspective and anything else we can put into it all. Excellent, thanks Bernard and thanks for joining us. Um, before we begin, I'll frame today's discussion within the bigger picture context that 
uh, Bernard was just referring to, from which it's being presented. And viewed in light of COVID-19, and I've been hearing that referred to as COVID-1984 recently, and <laughs> BLM Antifa-related unfoldments, both toxic feminine and masculine programming are critical issues that many sincere aspirants are being called upon right now to acknowledge, to come to more deeply understand and address. Because whether or not we do so has a direct impact on our choices of response to these unfoldments. Choices that serve either to exacerbate or wisely counterpoise them. The intense, intensely regressive nature and rapid onslaught of these unfoldments are indicative of the accelerating consciousness evolution cycle transition process. In other words, we've moved into the phase, and I don't have no idea how long this phase will last, but the phase of the transition process wherein it's time to make a definitive choice. The choice to align either with truth, particularly around our deepest understandings of what we in this reality really are and what it's for and why we're here, or with ignorance or denial of those truths. The choice to align either with service to self creation or service to others co-creation. The choice to align either with progression oriented forces of consciousness or with regression oriented forces of consciousness. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with my work, progressive and regressive consciousness are my terms for the two fundamental qualities of consciousness. In other words, good and evil. <laughs> Despite our ability to ever intellectually grasp the greater implications, enormity, and power of cycle and timeline transition in the context of the new world birthing process, and whether ego wants to or not, now is the time to make the choice to either learn by way of self-mastery and self-work and other processes how to ride that unfurling wave of the collective transition to divine will embodied beings and co-creation or to resist it thereby intensifying and prolonging suffering through avoidance of the inevitable it's important to note too that the self-mastery self-work processes are ongoing and getting stabilized in those takes time. Overseer orchestrated toxic masculine programming is a complex, multi-layered, controlled opposition tactic within the greater divide and conquer strategy. Although it simply isn't possible for us to touch on every aspect or nuance of toxic masculine programming, we'll be unpacking it holistically, taking all layers of being into account physical, psychological, emotional, metaphysical, interdensity dimensional, and spiritual layers, as well as the different life areas affected by this programming, such as personal and professional relationships, work, uh, career, recreation, and so forth. The topic will be broached from a trivium-inspired <laughs> three areas of discussion framework, beginning with grammar and logic, which can be distilled into examining processing, and coming to understand the what, who, when, where, and why data, and finally leading into rhetoric, which revolves around how, in other words, how you use this knowledge, and acting in accordance with that knowledge as appropriate to each of your life situations. Now, I'll begin the discussion by asking each panelist to respond to these general questions. What is toxic or regressive masculine programming? What does it look like and how can it play out in men's lives? James, what would you like to share with us? Um, thank you for that introduction, Marianne. And I'm glad that Bernard mentioned the, the hyperdimensional aspects because I, I believe that that's the, the template, the uh, the underpinning of all this because of the long-term genetic manipulation by reptilians and other beings, other regressive beings, let's say, the males of our species over time, and this really coalesced in the form of these um, 
fraternal orders, these brotherhoods, these patriarchal uh, religions, these uh, astronomer priest type uh, organizations that go back into antiquity, the dawn of time, because of the long-term genetic manipulation, neurological manipulation, and religious manipulation, there developed this concept of, of, of male superiority, for lack of a better term, uh, at, at the expense of, of the females. And it was a form of controlling and subduing the divine feminine by making it a world dominated by astronomer priest, by uh, priest in their Saturnian robes, you know, what have you. And it manifests in this today, I mean, it still lingers in the form of a knee jerk response from unhealed males to try to still keep women in their place. And when I say this, I, I'm skirting around all this nonsense and all this deliberate confusion by third wave feminism, by those who promote the hate on males uh, strategy, uh, divide and conquer issue. I'm talking about it from a, a male female perspective. And we can see this in our day to day world. We can see this especially in, in social media where so called keyboard warriors become emboldened because of the anonymity and the, the geographical distance from their quarry, if you will. So let's say that a woman on a newsfeed, a Facebook newsfeed, makes a comment about something or gives an opinion about something or shares a post or an article about something. Very often, there's this male that pops up, an unhealed male, a male who consciously or subconsciously has a need to correct women, to keep women in their place. So this male in our example will pop up and say, well, where did you get this information from? Here's something from Snopes.com that you know debunks that. Where did you get your information from? This knee jerk. Now to be sure, some of those are paid trolls. Some of them are what, what they call sock puppets where one individual can man or woman, <laughs> numerous different accounts and make it seem as if all these different people are chiming in. But a great many of them are real individuals, real males. Uh, there, there's one individual who comes to mind where he has this need to correct women all the time and, and keep women in their place. And he's made pronouncements where, <clears throat> well, you know, these podcasts are just such sources of, of confusion and lies and what have you don't listen to podcasts don't do podcasts and if, and especially like when a woman pops up with an opinion or with an article let's say that is threatening quite frankly to these unhealed males that's when they rise up and one will notice there's an imbalance whether it's because of reticence on the part of males who are you know, at various levels of, of understanding of truth, and truth is the most objective of, of terms. But one will notice that most of the people who post about truth oriented information on social media are women. It, and it, it reflects the basic nature of women that they like to share, they like to talk, they like to emote about certain things. Whereas males, and this is something we all have to work on, I'm still a work in progress. This this uh, urge to just cut to the chase, get to the point. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but this is how we deal with the issue. That's not how women communicate. That women need to talk things out. It doesn't make them inferior in any way. It's incumbent upon us males to be able to stifle ourselves long enough to allow the, the women to have their voice and, and to actualize and be a part of the discussion. And so what I see in social media, getting back to that very basic theme, which we see all the time, 
a disproportionate number of the, the naysayers, and these people wouldn't even classify really as trolls, a lot of them. Uh, these are just males that have this misogynistic uh, thing going on. And to me, misogyny is inherently intrinsically a reptilian mindset. It's inherently intrinsically a reptilian uh, mode of behavior. Uh, here's a woman who's expressing herself getting certain information out, and then this male feels compelled uh, through some unholy compulsion or whatever the case may be to put her in her place. So I think that you will see this. It's an ongoing process. Mostly males do this. Very seldom do I see women doing this to other women or, or males. Usually when, when a woman raises questions, it'll be kind of an open-ended thing where she's just curious about the subject and would like more information or never heard of it, doesn't understand it. It's not this uh, blanket type of debunking slash ridicule that goes on. So uh, long and the short of it is these are manifestations of this toxic male uh, persona that comes out at times to try to keep women in their place. And we see this reflected all across the board, actually. So that's my, my take on that. Oh, you're, you're muted. You're Marianne, muted. you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh, that's all right, there you are. Um, you made some excellent points, and I do see what you're describing happen on occasion and in fact speaking of <laughs> social media posts that was one of the things that inspired me to do this i had been wanting to do it anyway but i noticed a post that a, a response to a post a comment that was uh, in response to someone posting about all the you know the covid19 and blm antifa crap going on and in the midst of all that mostly women commentary there was a man a, a comment by a man and he said where are all the real men in this so that's what basically really inspired me to do this thank you thank you james for your comments evie what would you like to contribute oh well i gosh there's just so many wonderful ways that we could address this and so i guess i'm going to say it based on the first question you had which was you know what is toxic male programming. And so I wanted to define it because I'm kind of academic, but I'm also a therapist. So I, I kind of look at things in terms of um, psychological origins and ideological origins of infected narratives that cause suffering and falsehood to be perpetuated over the generations and then affect behaviors and then the behaviors which are toxic and abusive, which cause a cascade of reactions and behaviors that create more toxicity. So if I wanted to define uh, toxic male programming, um, actually James mentioned it, is, is the origin of page, what I call patriarchal narcissism, which actually started as probably some religious and even ancient cultural ways of making the assumption um, that the feminine gender is, is inferior. So if we take it from that standpoint, um, then we can see that there's a narcissistic quality to that belief system of male entitlement and superiority. So that the root of that is actually what I would call a narcissistic belief system, which is toxic. So superiority, entitlement, and lack of empathy, which would be the lack of emotional intelligence, which is actually necessary for a true um, healthy emotional connection in relationship and in family. So if that primary infection um, dominates, then we will have a whole cascade of unhealthy behaviors and unhealed reactions, you know, interpersonally, relationships, communities, countries, globally. So it plays out in an obvious way, right, with the male superiority, although that's changing in society. But I would say that I call it the, the patriarchal narcissism infection in the ideologies, which make the assumptions of superiority, entitlement, and uh, lack of empathy. So if I wanted to go further in, you know, how does that manifest? What are the 
there's definite belief systems and then emotional triggering based on wounding and false belief systems, which cause toxic behaviors. So as a psychologist, I would say that these would manifest in certain pervasive personality disorders or, or behaviors which would be toxic. Uh, for example, uh, narcissistic personality disorder would be the most prominent, like a malignant narcissist or a psychopath or a sociopath or a type of uh, predator, um, you know, spiritual predator guru that's hosted by uh, reptilians or d demonic forces. That's like the more prominent negative ones, but then it could be less prominent to be maybe a covert narcissist or a, a cluster B personality disorder like borderline, or maybe just a covert narcissist or uh, something like an addict or an avoidant uh, personality such as somebody like we've seen this in males a lot, which would be like the Asperger syndrome, avoidant, emotionally unavailable type of male, which they're not necessarily violent and, and uh, in an overt way, but they would have a covert, emotionally neglectful, toxic behavior, which would um, cause their relationships and their families to have wounded behaviors, which would perpetuate more toxicity. So I guess from a psychological standpoint, I would say that that is definitely happening because of the primary infectious ideologies, which are false, which means, you know, of course we are equal in complementarity in yin and yang and male and female, but there are assumptions otherwise, which are lies, right? So whenever there's lies perpetuated, you have wounding and trauma, which would go into what I call what I've learned more recently to be a really good way of understanding emotional wounding and how to uh, heal from that so that we have no longer abusive toxicity going on, which would be to recognize uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder and how it manifests in different personality types and different behavioral types. So this is actually profound because what I see, and I'm sure many of you would agree that there's a type of what I call spiritual bypassing, which takes place with many of the different Orthodox religions and even spiritual practices that are supp supposedly helpful, like meditation or this and that. But you see like this complete vacancy of a missing link with what I call emotional intelligence and the true healing which would cause someone to be more, quote, progressive or mature in their um, psychological and emotional and spiritual makeup. So I think the understanding of complex post-traumatic disorder is not understood. So when we can heal that and increase the emotional literacy and intelligence of men to be able to be okay with that level of healing and sharing, then they can become the true warriors and defenders and protectors of that which is sacred, which they were actually called for. And so many men, because of their lack of ability to heal, because they're told, well, they're not supposed to cry, they're supposed to be tough, and so they can't connect with the deep core, which is the true power. So if you can't connect with core power, you're not powerful. You can't be a true protector, but you can be an abuser or you can be a fake protector. So I guess we need to do the true healing and the emotional literacy, I think, which would be how to bring forth a more divine, healthy masculine. So I think I'd rather stop there. I don't want to complicate it with too much psychology, but I understand it in terms of psychology. And then from there, then we could provide solutions to how we can, you know, create a healing for the toxic masculine so they can come forth to actually be the divine protectors of that which is sacred. Thanks, Evie. Um, a lot of excellent points there. And you can get as <laughs> psychology-based as you want. <laughs> a lot of, we have a lot of armchair psychologists out there, so <laughs> yeah. don't, don't let that stop you. Um, Bernard, what, do you, what would you like to add? Well, thank you guys. That's already a lot to unpack. <laughs> you guys want to, but it's awesome. A uh, quick note to what uh, James shared, definitely social media. And I've, uh, I've, well, my partner, Laura, 
my wife, she has experienced exactly what uh, James talked about that simply for, you know, my wife, she also looks a bit younger than she actually is with, thanks to her Asian genes on Facebook. And then certain males simply don't or men simply don't take her serious for A, being a female and B, looking a certain way or looking young, whatnot, you know, and don't talk about the content. So there's already that kind of judgment and talking down or passive aggressiveness or making fun of. So it's all across the board, you know, so that's, and, and James is also right. It's a whole topic on its own, but people, you know, anonymous people behind the keyboard become way more courageous rather than how they would talk to you face to face. Right. <laughs> so that's the one thing. Um, yeah. Again, so many different levels to look at it from, you know, I've also definitely can see it from light of the hyperdimensional perspective, the interbreeding, the genetic modification, reptilian hyperdimensional perspective and all of that, which is a part of it. Right. And I also, when, as, as James was talking about it, it reminded me also like that in a sense, you know, the feminine principle or women have been also degraded in a sense because they also have the creative potential, the creative power. And that has been hijacked by the reptilian mind, right? Because we know these entities, STS forces, negative hostile forces, however you may want to call them, they lack creativity, right? They need us to manifest their reality through us. So they need our own creativity. And the feminine is always associated with the creative principle. I mean, a woman makes life, right? So that's from that level, that's also, in my view, the, the feminine has been suppressed for all these ages because of, of the hijacking of the creative principle. Um, now, but it's also important, like what Eve said, to really look at also from a basic psychological perspective. And this is very important. I think in this day and age, it's almost, I feel, mandatory to have a basic psychological understanding. Unfortunately, none of us have been taught that, right? And it starts in school, like Eve, Eve, Eve already mentioned. And for me, just to bring in a nutshell, toxic masculinity, it's also kind of, the beginning I had a bit, uh, we talked about before, a bit trouble with the word toxic masculinity, <laughs> you know, because it can be a bit shame inducing, right? What is it, you know, and especially in this day and age, what with all the social justice warrior cult programming and everything else that's going on, third wave feminism, or fourth wave feminism, what James talked about, what they, they call toxic masculinity is actually healthy masculinity, right? It's like the baby thrown out with the bathwater. Um, but don't bring it to the nutshell. It's like it all goes back what James and Evie also talked about. Toxic masculinity is, is men that are wounded, deeply wounded, right? hurt, traumatized, like we all are to varying degrees, right? And a lot of it has become normalized. Toxic masculinity has become normalized. Similar what Sri Aurobindo's famous, uh, I mean, Krishnamurti's famous quote of, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And we live in a sick society. And then we are trying to adjust to that in man as well. And the reason for that, as I've experienced myself in my upbringing and, and, and Evie, um, pointed out is just on the very basic level, the educational system, because true healthy masculinity also uh, requires emotional intelligence. And this is not what we're taught in school, right? And to bring it even further, open up further. So there's definitely also, there are gender differences, by the way, biological and characteristically. So, you know, don't get me, that's a whole topic on its own, that that's kind of being destroyed as well. Like um, the whole gender of, whatever, you can choose your gender in this day and age and whatnot. Um, but it also goes, it does go beyond gender. When we talk about masculine and feminine, you know, we can also talk about states of consciousness or um, expressions of consciousness or energies like yin and yang, like we all have men and women. We all have male and female aspects of, of consciousness, right? So it's interesting, like, I, I, one of my teachers and whose, whose work I studied a lot uh, is Philip Shepard and I highly recommend his work. He wrote two books, Radical Wholeness and New Self, New World. And he talks about the male, uh, the male aspect of consciousness and the female aspect of consciousness, regardless of gender. And he made a very interesting point. He said that we don't necessarily live in a patriarchy ruled by, you know, biological men, but in the patriarchal society where we live in a, a dominated by the, male aspect of consciousness. And what is the male aspect of consciousness? It's head-centric living, caught in the head. And we see this in an educational system. The IQ is worshiped, information, grading, knowledge, and uh, just information and just 
uh, competition, but you don't learn anything about your emotional intelligence, right? You don't learn anything about uh, your intuition and or embodiment and any of that. And those are feminine principles. The feminine principle is rooted in the body, right? It perceives wholeness in nature. And it's not about the demonizing the intellect or the mind, but it has just become very unbalanced. It, it shows itself in the body-mind split. And the irony of it all is that hardcore feminists are completely caught in the male aspect of consciousness, <laughs> right? So they are just caught in the head and they are just, you know, are very aggressive and compartmentalize and don't see unity and are not really compassionate and empathic, empathic. And I'm sure you guys talked about it maybe in the feminine uh, uh, webinar on the toxic feminism that a lot of these feminists are completely removed from the divine feminine actually, right? So I noticed it in my, speaking a bit about myself, you know, I grew up, you know, in Germany in high school was typical outsider. I got bullied in school, very insecure and all of this are very sensitive. Uh, I didn't learn to stand up for myself back then. I didn't learn anything about emotional intelligence, right? Like, because the male aspect of consciousness is also about the warrior archetype to stand up for yourself, to fight back and all of that, right? I was more in the passive and nobody, not, not, nobody prepared me for life, right? Like that's the issue we see a lot of men and similar to Eve and, and Marianne as well. I work a lot with clients one-on-one, -on -one. I work a lot with men, with men. And what I've noticed, I'm sure you guys can re relate, um, it takes a lot for a man to ask for help, to show vulnerability, to own like, oh my God, I'm fuck I need some help. You know, there's this whole uh, classical programming as, as young men or young boys experience already of like, you know, boys don't cry, toughen up, be a man and all of that. I need to get a, you know, hold it all up together, right? Which it is, it's a distortion of, the warrior archetype, which sometimes needs to like, here I am, I'm, I'm got, I can't just like, uh, I need to, you know, toughen up. So, so there's kind of like um, a truth in that, but it has become, it's not integrated because sometimes you need to just suck it up and just go, we're soldiers, just go and move on. But it has, to, it has become very unbalanced, right? So they're completely removed from, from the vulnerability because vulnerability is equated with weakness in comparison to other males, right? And then the competition about women and like, you know, and all of that. So it's, it's very, very complex, but men are very deeply wounded. So, and I'm, I see it in my, the courses um, I host by myself with my wife, Laura, the retreats we are hosted together. It's interesting, you know, you go to any yoga class, when I went to yoga classes, dance class, whatever, like out there, there's always 80% women, 20% men. Because women are just already naturally more open to the work and men are not. And I always, why is that, you know? And it ties into this, this, you know, this masculine wound. I don't want to even say toxic masculinity, but ma masculine wound, right? Of, of not even being able to go there because they have decades or years of this armoring and toughening up, right? And I would also say that there are some sort of genetic um, predisposition for women to be able to engage this work more. It comes naturally for them, you know, again, not to generalize, but generally speaking, women are usually more in touch with their intuition, right, with their psyche than men, you know, and vice versa. Some men, women can also be more stuck in the masculine energy and some men are more feminine, right? But it comes to, about balancing these two aspects. But the core of it all is, is like on a very basic level, PTSD, childhood wounding, narcissistic wounding, and all of that, which we are not being taught to heal or, or how to even navigate. I had to figure it out all my, myself. And even I'm, you know, I came from the opposite end. I was always too sensitive, too open, too much sharing, right? Too much emotion, I mean, the feminine principle. My path has been actually to activate more the, um, no, boundaries. Boundaries is a male aspect. No, without feeling guilty, without letting people uh, walk over me. And, you know, also uh, embodying the, uh, the protector, the provider and all of that to stand up in my, male as, in my male essence as the warrior to make a living for myself, for my wife and all of these things, right? Which um, have been also in this day and age become completely, you know, fragmented. I mean, we know about the destruction of the tra traditional family and all of that and where hedonism is, is, is equated with openness and spirituality and that of pathology normalized you know sexuality that's a whole other topic on its own and it's 
it's it's it's again it's multidimensional and i would say from a multi from a hyperdimensional perspective this is where the reptilians these entities so-called hostile forces tag into right into the wounds right and then they eat off the luge just the sexual luge and that's how a lot of men become predators rapists narcissists and all of that and again it's not about excusing anything but a lot of men that engage in that taking aside full-blown psychopaths sociopaths who are really possessed by these entities are just deeply wounded right they need healing and as the problem i see nowadays how men are being shamed a lot of shame you know i've i've worked just to finish my point and we can get into this as well i work with a lot of men also who suffer from porn addiction it takes a lot of courage for men to admit that because they're also being shamed right oh you know we know porn is bad but porn in itself is just a symptom of a completely uh, where sexuality has become pathologized in this world it's just a symptom right and we need to have create a you know condition so to speak um where we have can men allow themselves to open up right without being attacked without being shamed and all of that and that's for example we see in, in the mainstream the shadow side of the me too movement right this male hostility or just hating on on men you know what i mean and and completely taking it to the other extreme, the same with feminism and all of that. So it's really also having compassion for men that are deeply wounded. Um, excellent. You you touched on a whole slew of things right there. <laughs> so um, thank you for all that. And to kind of follow up with that, um, I'll just kind of do a distillation of what the three of you have been talking about sort of a, a summary of how I would encapsulate um, toxic or regressive masculine programming. And, it, and from my perspective, it's basically encompasses any idea, ideology, uh, dogma, philosophy, creed, or belief that engenders and reinforces deep misunderstandings and distortions around the sacred masculine principle and the regressive use of masculine co-creational energies. And by default, toxic masculine programming engenders and reinforces deep misunderstandings around the sacred feminine principle and distorts uh, the feminine co-creational energies, you know, misuse of those energies or, or exaggerating them. Now, of course, the inverse of those dynamics also applies to toxic feminine programming. But in a nutshell, toxic masculine programming encompasses toxic feminine programming and vice versa. They are the two sides of a controlled opposition tactic designed to divide and keep us divided within. Um, and it's impossible to be incarnate in this reality, at this time at least, and be completely unscathed by this programming and its attendant trauma. Even if you grew up in a reasonably functional, happy, um, healthy, supportive home environment. Now, I want to touch on, and there's a gazillion different ways this plays out, and all of these different forms of programming, not just regressive feminine and masculine, but all manner of programming that goes on here. Um, but one that was, it's kind of personal to me. Um, and it's not, I wouldn't necessarily categor direct, uh, categorize it directly as regressive masculine programming, but when combined with that, as Bernard was talking about, the boys don't cry. Um, be a man, man up, um, grow up, and all of that. This particular um, toxic, it's a family dynamic, becomes particularly toxic, and it's called parentification. Now, this can happen to women as well, and what it basically boils down to is when one or both parents turn to the child and looks to them for taking on certain aspects of the parental roles or completely reverses them in some cases. And this is what happened to my brothers. Um, when I was about seven, my father 
uh, my parents divorced and my father basically disappeared from our lives. And that's when she began turning to my two older brothers for help and support. Now, unlike physical or sexual abuse, <coughs> pardon, parentification is quite a bit less visible. And so, you know, it's rarely talked about. And that's why I wanted to talk about it, because this happens a lot. And it can happen not only in the case of divorce, but when there's the death of a parent or sibling, alcoholism or drug addiction by one or both parents, um, chronic disease or disability by one or both parents, or even a sibling, um, mental illness by one or both parents, physically abusive relationships between parents or physically or sexually abusive parent-child relationships or just having an immature emotionally unavailable or depressed parents and sensitive gifted and empathic children are the most susceptible to this um my both of my brothers were just that very highly sensitive extremely intelligent and i would say even as young children fairly emotionally intelligent. Um, like I said, psychic, empaths, very sensitive. And so they were both prime targets, if you will. And again, this isn't about blaming my parents. If we blame, we get stuck there. But just the observation and hopefully helping some viewers maybe recognize, because this is another struggle for men, um, even recognizing. And we all have blind spots for being able to recognize some of the um, programming and abuse that we've actually been subjected to. So to survive parentification, <clears throat> um, well, first, shame and guilt <laughs> and self-blaming are classic symptoms of this and other forms of chronic childhood trauma, uh, also known as, Evie said, as complex PTSD or CPTSD. And to survive parentification, individuals can adopt various strategies based on their personalities, personalities and any resources that were avail available to them. Um, sometimes the roles that these children take on can range from caregiver to protector to provider to mediator to rescuer, um, things along those lines. And what basically happens is that they're forced into adulthood when they're very, very young. And it can have all sorts of negative consequences, not only in terms of psychology and emotion, but chronic physical disease and illnesses that can play out. And this happened for um, one of my brothers. But some can become, you know, the comedian, the family comedian or the class clown, and as adults, this ends up turning into using humor as a means of masking their emotions. You know, um, sometimes humor can be used to hurt people. Again, a deflective mechanism to keep the individual from having to share or reveal his vulnerabilities or his emotions. Um, some of them become super compliant people pleasers because they hoped that by being the rescuer or the mediator or whatever, that they would be loved. And as adults, they often have no concept of boundaries whatsoever, and my brothers didn't. Some leave home early to escape, you know, in pursuit of freedom from all this, but they're very wary of relationships and fearful of being engulfed by a relationship. So they end up isolating themselves, pushing away love and intimacy, even when they are in relationships. Some of these individuals shouldered all of the responsibilities very diligently, but they become perfectionists who are never able to let go of that illusion of control of or, or ever relax. And this was the case for my older brother. I mean, he was just a living, breathing anxiety. I mean, not even anxiety attacks, but he just was riddled with anxiety for the whole of his short life. Um, so much so that he ended up Literally, he died of bone cancer. And I know that this anxi anxiety that he carried from early childhood played a huge role in that. In the 
<clears throat> excuse me, in the case of my brother, he was always a natural mediator. He was the Libra. He had that good sense of inner balance naturally. And he fell into the role of rescuer big time as an adult. And sadly, um, his last rescue, so to speak, ended up murdering him when he was only 23. So there's far reaching, and I'm, I'm just barely touching on this. There are so many other aspects to this. And if you are someone who feel like this may have happened to you, please investigate this. Get more information about it because it's a very lethal, less visible form of all of this. And like I said, when used in combination with, you know, regressive masculine means and stereotypes and that sort of thing, it's particularly toxic. So now um, I'm going to phase into the next area of the discussion. Um, by asking panelists to kind of generally address these questions. So, you know, how the hell did we get here? <laughs> and why has all this happened? And we've touched on that somewhat. But why are so many men stuck in the flywheel of regressive masculine programming, or any sort of programming for that matter? Even many sincere awakening, self-mastery, and embodiment aspirants. Um, James, will you kick off for us here? Thank you, Marianne. I'd like to add very quickly a, a, an addendum to some of the points you just made. When this parentification uh, kicks in and it becomes somewhat toxic, uh, like if a son, in our example, falls into the role of the caregiver, there could be some good aspects of that, there could be some bad aspects of that. but certain cultures in particular i'm from the filipino culture i've heard similar stories from other cultures the greek culture uh, etc what sometimes happens is consciously or, or subconsciously um, the parents will create an environment where the help of, of the son or one of the sons is necessary and they become a caretaker and this could be at a very early age or even you know well into pretty much adulthood and what it results in sometimes is a failure to launch syndrome where the the son is so engaged in caring for his parents caring for his family becoming the caretaker of the household and at some level, sometimes these parents, one or both, don't really want to see their son leave the household, expand. Uh, they may even move out of the house, but they're still pretty much in the same neighborhood, a phone call, a text message away. So th that son, in our example, never really gets the opportunity to, to grow their own wings, to learn how to fly, to develop their own life skills. And, and Bernard touched on that, where the school system, the, the religious system, really leaves us ill-prepared to take on manhood, if you will. Uh, what the Romans, ancient Romans talked about, uh, putting on the manly gown to become, to go from childhood to become a man, right? And, and, and to answer your, your question, how do we get here uh, and up? Uh, if you wouldn't mind to rephrase the last bit of that, that question, Marianne. Sure. The, why are so many men stuck in the flywheel of this kind of programming? Um, you know, how do we get here? Why this happen? And why are so many men stuck in this flywheel? Even, you know, uh, more switched on people, so to speak, you know, many sincere awakening and self mastery and embodiment aspirants included. Yes, uh, that's a good question. And, and I've s seen it run the gamut. Uh, in the prior example, in the previous question, I was thinking about a particular guy, uh, very matrix oriented, uh, very much anti-conspiracy. Uh, when I made that point that he was going around telling people on social media, don't listen to podcasts, don't do podcasts, etc. cetera, he, he was imposing his will on the people on his newsfeed and his friends list that they shouldn't go outside the mainstream narrative because actually what was happening was his wife was starting to wake up. 
his wife was starting to question, okay? And uh, certain girlfriends were putting out certain information, which was making this woman wake up. And here comes her husband, and he starts putting out all these passive aggressive posts about, you know, the psychological need of conspiracy theorists to think that, you know, the world is this nasty place full of conspiring evil people when actually it's quite the opposite when people deny that level of conspiracy it's because they want to stay in their safe zone you see so that example is germane to this topic because there is this need on the part of some males to retain some semblance of control and like bernard said I've literally been at death's door and were it not for a friend of mine <laughs> who insisted I get in the car with her and she'd take me to the hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. I was had walking pneumonia, extreme asthma, uh, very little oxygen content was getting into me. If left to my own devices, I may have just died. But my, my friend took me to the hospital, insisted I go with her because even at death's door, I literally refused to go to the hospital. There was something in me, some kind of programming, inbuilt programming that prevented me to see the obvious, that I was in, in very dire straits. And, and so what some males do to compensate is try to assert control in areas where they think they can at least retain control. They may see their grasp their control slipping in certain areas of their life, but they can still retain control of this. Uh, their, their predominant position in a male-female partnership, for example. What I would like to see more with males that are in relationships is to encourage the initiative of their, their, their wives and girlfriends. Not to the point of, well, you just take care of everything. You take care of the finances, you take care, <laughs> you take care of the shopping, you take care of the kids. I'm just gonna play video games. I, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is encourage their partner to expand. Oh, you, you want to get into aromatherapy. I'm all for that. You want to do this. You want to, uh, you know, you want to take these courses. Uh, uh, you know, for, for self-help. Too often with these regressive, unhealed males, there's an element of them that is, I don't know if passive-aggressive is the right word, but th th there's an element of them where if they begin to see their partner take these strides, uh, become more assertive, uh, and uh, want to expand their horizons, they feel an element of losing control. Well, she's got more, you know, she's meeting new friends. She's going out with her friends at work and, and they feel almost excluded, but it's not really exclusion. It's what's happening is that partner, that girlfriend, that wife is developing their own assertiveness and developing their own uh, uh, persona, right? And, and that should be encouraged that should be encouraged where it's truly an equal partnership. Uh, like, like with Kylie and I, there's certain things that she's a lot better at me with, than I'm at. And I strive to be as good as her in, in some of those categories. Uh, but sometimes she's just a lot better at things. She's a natural organizer. She, she's just very switched on in certain things. And I'd be a fool to try to curb that or try to limit that uh, because of whatever hangups or whatever you know, issues that I haven't worked through. So I would like to see males make an effort to you know, inspire their partners to, you know, within the context of a healthy, balanced relationship, be all they can be, so to speak even in certain areas of, of the, uh, the family, certain areas of, of the, par the partnership, to even take on a leadership role in, in things that they're good at. And 
and not feel threatened by the idea of that concept where they feel like they're losing control, they're relinquishing control. Oh, if I let her take these courses, if I let her go to these uh, uh, workshops, she's going to meet someone, she's going to get into an affair, and, you know, all these fears and everything could start bubbling up. Those are issues that, you know, project themselves outwards. Instead of seeing the benefits, instead of seeing what good can come out of it, which can then rebound and enhance the relationship between the two, the, the toxic, unhealed uh, male only sees problems, right? Only sees uh, potential pitfalls. So part of what I feel uh, as far as a, as a male developing and healing and reintegrating properly and trending in the right direction uh, in life is the, the ability to recognize one's own limitations, the ability to recognize uh, where one's wisdom ends and where one's ignorance begins, uh, not be uh, afraid to ask questions, to seek help, and uh, to you know, find out from others, uh, see, see, where the toxicity comes in is in our example of the, the, inter the male internet troll. How often have we seen things on the internet, on, on Facebook, where I don't agree with that, but it, we're not compelled to jump on there and, and make, make an internet scene, right? See, th that's where the balance comes in, where you could philosophically say to yourself, uh, don't really see it, uh, much into that, but just move on, scroll on and, and do something else where one doesn't feel this need to always correct and always, but that's very self-limiting, okay? So in our example, in, in, in a domestic situation, rather than trying to confine and inhibit their partners and their children by extension, if one is raising children, always look to inspire, always look to lead by example. And one thing that I've had to do Right now, there are some things around the house where a professional handyman will do the job much better than me. And if there's a time issue and and, and it's affordable within the budget, you know, get a guy in here who knows what he's doing. Right, but some things I have to make the effort. I have to learn how to do certain things. So, you know, and there's no shame to going on to YouTube and well, how do you do this? How do you do that? not just for computers, not just for internet stuff, but, but for stuff around the house. And, and ego is a block to learning. If we put ourselves in a situation where we think we know everything, or there's nothing left to learn, there's nothing, there's no areas in our life that we need to improve upon anymore, then, then the growth stops, right? We, I feel that part of manhood is this striving to, to get better, if not excel at everything, to just be very good at and trending in the direction of, of being a better person all around. Interpersonal relationships, uh, as far as the ability to work with, with tools and con construction and, and, and landscaping, whatever the case may be, as much as possible, try to emulate what our, our ancestors did. Right? By the time our ancestors were 25 years old, they, they were so well versed and, and, and skilled in, in animal husbandry, in agriculture, in, in, in hunting and fishing, in, in repairs. And today, when, when I look at the male uh, that, that's being depicted, especially in cinema and in Hollywood, what we see is, is a very incomplete person. What we see is, is someone who has little or no life skills, right? Uh, the people in my generation, in, in my old neighborhood in the, in the early 80s, we all used to go out and do things outdoorsy. We used to go fishing. We used to go hiking. We used to go camping. Um, we used to go take long walks. And my friends back in San Jose were nuts. I mean, they would be at the base of this crazy mountain. And they say, let's go up. Let's climb. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, we don't even have any ropes or anything, right? But, but that was the mindset back then that, you know, let, let's, let's tackle this. Let's do this. 
uh, we have it within us, an innate ability to, to achieve and to overcome. And so I would like to see that also within males, that they, um, you know, are able to just take on these challenges, like Bernard said, take on these challenges and, and you know, overcome them, find solutions instead of looking for reasons not to do things or, or uh, looking for reasons for failure. Find opportunities to succeed. And that's pretty much my, my thoughts on that. Thanks, James. You touched on a lot of really important points and I think some very real examples of kind of what's going on with a lot of men here. Um, thanks a bunch for your input. Um, just one second here. The very question was, what are actually are the stumbling blocks that seem to be preventing men from moving forward to become a more balanced, healed, and stronger male in terms of more of a divine masculine, a healthy masculine? And, and what I see is um, lack of um, information and lack of understanding and the willingness to, to heal the core causes of what's causing the stumbling blocks, which a lot of it is the trauma, early trauma, and the complex PTSD and the addictions and the um, behaviors which are um, like neglectful parenting or abusive parenting or any of the complex PTSD uh, things like uh, the primary fighters or the fight flighters who avoid emotional feelings. So they go into the fight flight dissociative mode of obsessive compulsive perfectionic, what do you call it? Perfectionistic workaholism or alcoholism or um, compulsivity on a left brained stay in your head kind of thing, which may not be abusive like physically, but it causes emotional neglect so that the relationship suffers with the wife and children. Um, and, and the lack of recognition of those toxic, neglectful behaviors. Um, in fact, you know, if I would want to go into a personal example of something that Mary Ann was talking about, uh, that I've seen even in people that I know who grew up in, uh, in countries where World War II was, they were occupied territory of the Nazis, and the parents and underwent trauma, and the trauma was not healed. So there was an alcoholic raging parent who was a workaholic and a rageaholic and an alcoholic and emotionally neglectful. And then the, the mother was someone who had to take on the full parenting while the, the spouse was raging or drinking or unavailable. So she would turn to her children for the emotional support and created the golden child who would be the emotionally enmeshed uh, proxy partner to the mother. So the parentified son and all that was unhealed. And then like there was several children where one would be the, the caretaker, uh, rescuer, healer. And then the other one might have been the scapegoat child, the one who acted out, was like the bad kid. And then the other one who would be the golden child who would be the parentified son. And so that turned out to be the covert narcissist who, let's say, I was married to and emotionally neglectful, hidden rage, passive aggressive, covert narcissistic. So that creates the emotional neglect and the harm in the relationship, which creates extreme stress and extreme uh, emo narcissistic abuse. So that's what I see that they don't even know they have a problem. They don't know what they won't know because they're on a complete unconscious, complex PTSD, maladaptive way of um, avoiding emotion and staying in the head and staying in the dissociative compulsive workaholism and the repressed rage and the passive aggressive entitled golden child. I mean, that that's actually talked about a lot on YouTube about the, the narcissist, the covert narcissist is the result of the abuse from an unhealed um, dynamic. And so I think there's a lack of knowledge and understanding that that's even toxic that they're even doing what they're doing that causes great harm and suffering to their children and to others around them and to their partners. So they're, they don't know, they're, they're not able to make the connection between their emotional well-being and their, their mental. They don't even know that they're compulsively addicted to um, their entire core identity and a feeling. Their original self was evacuated. They've self-abandoned. They, a self-evacuation of the core spirit and heart 
of the their human nature has been is gone so they're they're functioning on the false ego which becomes hosted by darker powers and dysfunctional behaviors which cause great harm to everyone they're around okay so they don't know they don't know that they don't know that that's not good so it's like okay so i think men need to know what's healthy versus what's not healthy based on getting in touch with their core essence in in a in a place of safety so that they're not shamed you know for being a narcissist even though from my experience as a therapist the ones least likely to heal are the narcissists and those are the ones who took on the fight flight or the freeze flight complex ptsd maladaptive behavior which means that that's, that's not good because the ones who are the more raging fight, flight, they're not likely to heal because they believe they're superior and entitled and they lack empathy. So they, they've self-evacuated the spiritual core, which becomes easily hosted by hyperdimensional beings, which is why a lot of, uh, there's a lot of male predators in the spiritual community who think they're healers and they become completely hijacked by demonic forces. Okay, as I was saying, um, the stumbling blocks to the masculine to become less toxic and to be more healthy. Um, there's a lot of dysfunctional behaviors based on what has been normalized uh, through abusive family styles and relating styles. And I think it's the lack of awareness of what, what really is healthy. And I, I actually, I see a lack of male to male mentorship of males saying, you know, hey dude, you know, I noticed that you're doing this to like your wife and kids or you do this in your relationship. Stop that shit. All right. And for those who may be the more narcissistic, uh, fight contentious control manipulation types, they actually need someone to be assertive to say, Hey, I noticed that you do this. Um, it makes me feel like that. Would you please stop doing this and maybe try something else? And it takes an assertive person, um, possibly like another male or a buddy to say, something to them about how their behavior is like not okay because more often than not they won't take a woman seriously if she's complaining or if let's say she's been a spouse and she's so used to being beaten down or neglected that she may come off in a in a guilt manipulative um, passive way of not addressing that because she gave up because if you what happens is when you're dealing with a narcissist or somebody who's toxic and they keep doing the same things over and over they will gaslight you or, or fight or defend or deny so that the person who has to deal with them, they, they basically give up or they'll start resorting to actually more manipulative, passive aggressive ways, which become more and more toxic. So I think males actually need other male mentors to teach them how to basically, you know, if they've been to hell and back, and, and I've seen some males who actually literally have been to hell and back in terms of their own life experience. And, and because of their healing journey, because of what they've been through, and then their, their willingness to go to the depth of the core of their being on an emotional level, sometimes near physical death for many months in bed, or whatever their situation may be, they actually went to hell and back, and they came back and reconnected with their heart and with their soul and with all the emotions, and they, and they did their grieving, or they may have to get in touch with their anger, depending on what kind of person they are. And, and it's, it's basically like a hero journey. And I see that a lot of men actually don't have the male mentors to, to, to actually know what, what really is um, you know, a healthy masculine. And they don't really have the examples. And I think we really haven't learned a lot of this until recent psychology where they um, learn from the Vietnam vets, for example, with the combat um, post-traumatic stress and what was happening to a lot of these men who went to war to protect and defend and, and to be like honorable males to defend what they felt was like the right thing to do as a man they came back ab absolutely destroyed because they, they might have been lied to or the trauma of war or whatever they went to they weren't uh, prepared to deal with the consequences of post-traumatic stress and they became addicts and they weren't given the right types of support, whether medically or psychologically or in their families to deal with what they've had to deal with. And in more torn countries, you see this like in extremely dysfunctional families because these people never got to heal from the effects of war. 
and especially men. So the stumbling blocks actually would be why do wars keep happening over and over and over so that we never have enough of a break to get down to the, uh, what we call the Maslow's hierarchy of needs of the basic survival and the safety and interpersonal and protective supportive relationships where they actually can heal so they can actually build their strength to become you know, the, the hero journey where they, they basically came to hell and back. They didn't get stopped in their process of healing. And I think we're seeing you know, men who have been stalled in their process of healing because they don't have the information and they don't have the other male mentors to to basically help them and especially the ones that are more of the fight uh resisting big ego types but then also sometimes the passive ones have taken on being henpecked by a controlling and manipulative woman or a feminist where actually maybe they may need to say you know hey stop that shit i'm going to be assertive and i'm going to be who i am and shut the fuck up <laughs> I mean, sometimes it depends on who they are, what they need to do to become the full strength of who they are in an authentic way where they, where they really dealt with the core wounds or the, the complex post-traumatic stress. And they're able to actually know because they've had a mentor to say, hey, hey, dude, you're doing this. This is wrong. What you're believing is wrong. Have you ever checked what your core beliefs are about X, Y, and Z? Or about relationships or about what women are supposed to do or what kids are supposed to do so I just think they don't have enough mentors and positive um, examples and that, that would be a stumbling block they need more positive male mentors out there who are basically been to hell and back and they're they're good male mentors who are not on the distorted path and, and I've seen some that actually are distorted and they're out uh, mentoring males on actually distorted uh, certain distorted forms of sexuality actually <laughs> but i won't make i won't name names it's just that i've seen how it's progressed in society where they're actually normalizing for example i think they're normalizing porn addiction or they might be normalizing um multiple sexual partners and that's just normal for a man to do that whereas you know for women it's not normal and just you know put up and shut up and know that you know that's just going to happen and and that that's hurtful to, to women. So I think there's a lot of normalization of dysfunctional behaviors based on maybe they've never even seen it in a, in a culture, what was actually honorable. So I would just have to really go back to, you know, what are some good examples of men who are really honorable and, and males actually mentoring other males because that's what's needed. Yeah. Superb. Um, brilliant points there. There is a huge lack of <laughs> healthy male um, mentors out there and, and, you know, representatives of what that really means, you know, this whole lack of education around that. Bernard, what would you like to contribute here? On mute. Yes. Excellent points. A lot. Uh, thank you, James and Evie. And yeah, that's <laughs> a big one. The lack of uh, male role models. And ultimately, we know it ties into the father wound. Right. So that's that's a big one, too. And again, we cannot blame, like Marianne said, we cannot blame our parents because they are wounded, traumatized, it's cycle over cycle. Right. And also touching upon what, what Eve said about the wars keep continuing and on this trauma over trauma and you cannot heal trauma and then there's more trauma. I mean, that's that's the modus operandi of the matrix, the trauma installment program. Right. That's happening right now. It's a huge massive collective mk ultra experiment that's happening with the masks with the all of that you know what i mean that that's a that's a massive hyperdimensional ritual right the trauma installment i mean people are get, getting traumatized they don't even know they are traumatized right now i mean just imagine the children growing up under these conditions in schools and all of that right and then especially when the parents are also mind controlled and it just um you know, complacent, complacent with the whole new normal. So that's what we are experiencing now. But I can speak out of experience. For example, like I mentioned myself, again, my upbringing, I had a very distant father. He was a typical company man, a good man, right? He, but he also uh, was born at the beginning of a second world war. So he had his own, um, not only conscious trauma, but uh, just dissociated. So he was not there emotionally present for me. He was just always like, you know, um, distant so to speak even when it was there physically and he, you know he was a caring father but I could never talk to him about like guy 
uh, topics. I could never talk to him about other women and girls and all of that, ne not, neither to my mom really. So I had to also figure this whole thing out for myself, right? And I'm the first one to admit, like I, I learned about uh, sex and, and, and girls through porn back in the you know, late 80s, because that's like the big, back then the VHS tapes were going around high school. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> crappy stuff and, and the magazines. And that's my purity. But nobody told me. Like in school, I get just learned about the biology, but not healthy sexuality and, and how to be a man and how to talk to women and i remember even to my dad even in my late teens that i even was like i was getting upset with my dad like i couldn't that i cannot just sit down with you for beer and talk about women like i was missing that but and i was really angry at my dad back then now i have a lot of more compassion because i can see he had his own trauma from growing up in the war and that being in his emotional body and all of that so that's in an intergenerational wound but this father wound we all have to varying degrees right it's also a wound around authority and all of that and um you know and anybody has some sort of childhood wound. i think we need to point that out you know gabra mate i'm sure you guys are familiar with his work gabra mate and, and trauma work dr dr gabra mate from uh, canada and uh, my wife laura she studied with him uh, his modality compassion inquiry it's also about unraveling uh, childhood trauma and all of that and he always he gives these talks and whatnot and one of his sticks is so to speak you like he goes out in the audience and and asks does anybody have a healthy happy childhood right and then people are like yeah i had and like okay come on up i'm gonna prove you wrong <laughs> and then he does the process not because he's an asshole a sadist whatever he just shows you how we have normalized abuse right and then he goes through his process modality and literally within a few minutes it shows that it was not a happy childhood right that uh, abuse has been normalized even more overt abuse doesn't have to be the big t trauma but developmental trauma and all of that that there's no such thing as a complete happy childhood it doesn't exist right um so on that note like um it is important to f have these role models and also what we're deeply missing in the in our culture and in our modern culture what all the indigenous all the tribes all the cultures are deeply in tune with nature had is an initiation ritual from boy to manhood. We don't have that, you know? We're just throwing into it. And, and literally, you look at some tribes, they have like some tough uh, rituals, you know? A young boy, he's gonna be buried up to the neck and be in the, in the jungle dealing with all the insects to initiate him into a man. You have the sun dance and all of that to deal with the, confront the forces, to confront um, the, all the fears, you know, ultimately the fear of death, it's like a rebirth process and we don't have that at all. And I'm sure maybe you guys heard of this book. I heard, I heard about it for a long time and I finally got it. Um, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover is an excellent book and it was written, what is it? Yeah, 30 years ago, 1990. And it, it's an excellent book on boy psychology and male psychology combining mythology the hero's journey and Jungian psychology and i can highly highly recommend it about the archetypes king warrior magician lover and also about you know this this, this is male psychology but it ties it into very well into boy psychology which uh, many of us have not me, most men are boys in in suits in male suits so to speak you know what i mean and I can see it in myself, like sometimes my own wounded boy still comes out and it's not avoiding the boy, but it's like healing it in a child work. And I just for the sake of, of our um, discussion, I just want to share a little excerpt. He's um, right there, right here. It's, it's written by two guys, uh, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. The drug dealer, the ducking and div, um, diving pol political leader, the wife beater, the chronical crabby boss, the hotshot junior executive, the unfaithful husband, the company yes man, the indifferent graduate school advisor, the holier than thou minister, the gang member, the father who can never find the time to attend his daughter's school programs, the coach who ridicules his star athletes, the therapist who unconsciously attacks his clients shining and seeks a kind of gray normalcy for them, the yuppie, all these men have something in common. They are all boys pretending to be men. They go, they got that way honestly because nobody showed them what a mature man is like. Their kind of quote manhood is a pretense to manhood that goes largely undetected in such by most of us. We are continuously mistaking this man's controlling, threatening and hostile behavior for strength. 
In reality, he's showing an underlying extreme vulnerability and weakness, the vulnerability of the wounded boy. And that's really what we're dealing with, right, on, 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 a, on a massive scale. And then they write also here, they talk specifically about this missing um, ritual, the crisis in, in masculine ritual process, right? We hear it said that some man, that we hear it said of some man that he just can, can get himself together. What this means on a deep level is that so-and-so is not experiencing and cannot experience this deep co cohesive structure. He is fragmented. Various parts of, parts of his personality are split off from each other and leading fairly independent and often chaotic lives. A man who cannot get it together is a man who's probably not had the opportunity to, to undergo rit ritual initiation and the deep structure of manhood. He remains a boy, not because he wants to, but because no one has shown him the way to transform his boy energies into man energies. No one has led him into direct and healing experiences of the inner world of the masculine potentials, right? So that ties into this, the missing of the, um, of the initiation ritual. And also what Evie, I hope she'll come back soon. <laughs> we lost her for a minute. Um, what she talked about, the, the role models, right? And what is missing like from, you know, from the, the tribal culture and, or just even civilization have been more in tune with the male and female principle embodied within themselves in tune with nature is the most uh, important factor initiations in our culture. We have pseudo initiations, what they call it, but like soldiers, military, gang members, and all of that. These are just distorted initiations, right? Uh, and they write on a, a factor that makes most initiations in our culture pseudo initiations. In most cases, they simply, there simply is not a contained ritual process. A ritual process is contained by two things. First, a sacred space, you know, for like also have a sacred space for man to come together. We don't have this. What we have bars or something, we just drink, right? Uh, and the second is a ritual elder, a wise old man or wise old woman who is completely trustworthy for the initiate and can lead the initiate through the process and deliver him or her intact and enhanced on the other side. And that's what we're missing. And education, um, education doesn't, uh, doesn't provide that either, right? So we're not left, you know, it's not about finding now a shaman who's going to initiate it in this ritual process. Nowadays, we have the tools, modern psychotherapy, somatic psychopathy, embodiment processes. We can heal our, you know, there are a lot of tools. We can do this initiation process ourselves. I mean, I see it in myself, for example, like I got disillusioned in my late teens, early, uh, early 20s quit high school, I quit college, went here to the US to study drums and percussion, did the exact opposite of what my dad did, like complete creativity. And looking back through my 10, 20s, I went through my own initiation process by playing drums, expressing myself, right? Even I went to raves into the desert. That's why also even all these raves out there, these are almost unconscious initiation rituals because we all have that archetype within us, but it then becomes distorted, it becomes a drug infused, whatever, and people get hooked on that. But even that process helped me on some level to, to die to, to, what, you know, to my boy nature, so to speak, and, and that the man be born. But it, if it's not guided, if there's no knowledge, it can, you can get lost in the whole process as well. You know, that's why a lot of young men also get into drugs and all of that and, and addictions is because we're missing this ritual initiation, initiation, initiatory process. So that's what we need, you know, that role models and we don't even have role models in our culture right now you know in our culture narcissists are worshipped or like what eve talked about the distortion of some male um, facilitator so to speak i'm sure you guys heard about the um, pua movement the pickup artist movement right where like people literally like men make workshops on how to like that's a huge big movement on how to pick up women like, you know, the more women you can pick up, the more sex you can have, the more dates you have, the more phone numbers, the more you are a man. That's almost the culture, right? And I can see to myself being very insecure in my 20s. I had no success with, with the other sex whatsoever. But whenever I had a success and quote, unquote, I got laid, I felt, oh, I'm, I'm a man now, my ego, right? But it has nothing to do with being a true man. It was just like, it's like a drug, like trying to put a, a, a Band-Aid on, on a wound, right? To just, instead of healing the, the boy within, I would try to prop up my ego by trying to make myself feel better. That's why, you know, 
a lot of men, older men, they get their Ferraris or they buy this, the status symbol, right? To kind of compensate their own wound, right? Of not good enough, right? To show off, oh, I can afford this, I have this and that, and, and or the trophy wife, whatever, you know, and all of that. These are all like, like they write, um, boys in man suits. And that's, we see normalized in our culture. So it's really about, you know, the father role. And if you don't have it in real life, we, are, we have that archetype within this. So I can highly recommend for all men out there, even for you guys, if you haven't read it yet, King, Warrior, Magician, and Lover, Rediscovering the Archetypes of the Mature Masculine. And it's fascinating because it was written in 1990. And already back then, they were highly um, critical of feminism, of diminishing men right that there needs to be this healthy masculine of the warrior of just like you know what uh, uh, james also talked about you know the the earthy practical man who takes charge who takes care of himself his family his woman and all of that right and not turn it into this excuse me soy boy new age you know uh oversensitive whatever right it's kind of like that's the other extreme we need both we need to get to touch on our our vulnerability a being allowing men to process and cry and all of that and guilt and shame like marianne talked about guilt shame uh uh you know are the are the worst I, i've dealt this all my life you know the internal you know beating myself up right here hearing the the criticizing voice of society or my parents and whatnot and not, never feeling good enough right and so we need to have that vulnerability that emotional process emotional intelligence but at the same time, there needs to be the other process as well of, um, you know, the warrior aspect, the king aspect of just like, here I am show, showing up and being able to handle life, taking responsibility. And that I'm glad Evie talked about the, the hierarchy, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because most we also need to have the foundation. I see this, Ron, I talked about this a lot uh, a lot as well we need just the basic physical foundation i see there's a lot lacking in new age spiritual circles or in the conspiracy movement everybody's on the internet and you know i'm talking about the matrix conspiracy and we're being taken down and then da 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 and it's everything externalized but nobody's taking care of their physical um lives on the the foundation have a home right have a job take responsibility of your finances don't blame everything else for your finances the matrix no you need to become a self-responsible adult and that to create that foundation before we can even engage in deeper work so that's kind of my two cents on that and a good two cents it was <laughs> you covered some remarkable points the whole that evie opened the door to and you really delved into the whole rights of passage thing for men this like you said this culture you know what it, such as it is this homogenized culture has no you know anything no formal a uh, rite of passage i know that my brothers lack that sorely um my father did go to war and he was in world war ii a world war ii vet and i did not know him before but i knew him after the war and the bit that I did know about him, that I got to know about him before he left, and there was intermittent, intermittent um, contact in the years after my parents' divorce, very intermittent. But the more I learned about him, the more I realized just literally how wounded he was by the war. And although he had a remarkable father, I, I just loved his father, my grandfather. Um, his mother basically ruled that roost, so to speak. Very much a perfectionist, obsessive, you know, OCD kind of personality. And I know that took a great toll on my father. Um, he was an original sort of um, <laughs> anarchist, so to speak. He came back from the war and the terrors that he went through, and he never spoke to it, even with my mom, because she tried to get him to speak about it. But she said he never told her anything. But I, I do know, all I did know is that he lost, I think, three close friends. Boom. Just out of his life. You know, how can that not change you? How can that not deeply? And this is the time, they were still calling it shell shock. <laughs> but this is before the PTSD business. So men like my father came back 
and with no tools, nothing to work with, just shut down, close up, you know, close all those doors. And I, you know, and the generation that he grew up in that, you know, that he was from, there was no training about, you know, uh, emotional intelligence. You know, what was that? Boo. You know, and then go to war. And then you see what that does. Like it just, it carries over from one generation to the next. War is nonstop now, nonstop. And getting into the whole normalization of this thing, like Evie was talking about. Oh, you know, okay, guys go over there, but look how many come back. They come back and they're killing their dogs or maybe killing their spouses or partners. They're so deeply disturbed by the whole horror of war. So that's a big, huge why in all of this. Um, not an underlying, but a big causal factor, war. Uh, but my father came back and despite all he'd been through, and this was one of the big issues before my parents divorced, was that they had access to these, all sorts of VA programs after World War II. In other words, you could, if you came back from the war, you automatically qualified for a loan on a house. And my, you know, my mom told me she was all excited about that. But my dad absolutely refused. He was the other extreme. He's like, I'm going to take care of myself and my family. I don't want any handouts. And I think in later years, I figured out that I also had to do with he, when he finally got a good idea of what government was all about and who was really, who the wars were really for, they weren't for the common person. He just turned off. So in his own way, he was sort of an anarchist about that and turned off to government early on. But what this did to my brothers, um, after he got back, after my, you know, once he was back from the war and there, you know, kind of house full of kids all of a sudden. And my two brothers, my oldest brothers in particular, just used to crave. My father had his own business. He owned a mechanics stop at you know, a shop and you know had a couple of people working with him and my brothers would just ache to go be with him to watch him at work to be with dad and he wouldn't have any of it not because I don't think it was so much because he didn't want them to learn but after the war he was just paranoid about the possibility that his little boys could be hurt in that shop so that was a big shutdown for all of us. Don't want them to do, don't, don't let the kids do this. Don't let the kids do that. Just so overly protective after what he'd been through. The distorted protective that he just wanted to keep us in this little bubble. So war does horrible things. And <clears throat> so we start looking from one generation to the next. And like you guys were talking about, you know, we, we don't have any role models. We don't have any rites of passage for young men. Um, but these are the kind of things that dads and even young men could start looking into before they have children. It's like, what can I do? This was missing from me. How can I, you know, I can get some information on how to, you know, make this a part of my relationship with my son. Um, or, and, and I'm with daughters, mothers and daughters, same thing. But <clears throat> in terms of, some of the biggest sticking points, I believe, you've all sort of touched on this, but um, in, in my experience, you know, not just with my brothers and my own personal relationships and observation, but my, you know, more than 20 years working with clients, men, and some of the biggest sticking points were, um, I made a little list here, just a second. Um, sticking points for men, when it comes to disentangling from some of this programming and healing trauma towards claiming responsibility, self-responsibility, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute, but they tend to be extremely, you know, they're emotionally suppressed and armored. That's a big stumbling block. They, there is a lack of mastery of sexual energies or distorted like you were just talking about, uh, Bernhard, this, what it means to be sexual as a man. You know, there's just so many, so many distortions around that. So that's another biggie. Um, unawareness or denial of the programming and trauma that they have 
been subjected to. Most men would tell you, you know, you made mention of the whole Gabramati thing where he brings people up on stage and say, well, I had a great childhood. Well, maybe not so much. So, and, and these kind of men really struggle with that, you know, even acknowledging that they were traumatized in any way. Um, many of them being brought up in households where you don't say anything bad against mom or dad, especially older generations. You just don't talk trash about your parents. And it doesn't even have to be a matter, it's not a matter of trashing your parents, but just acknowledging that, they're fa that they were fallible human beings too, and being able to acknowledge that. And then the other thing, the, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that I found for men is that they tend to derive too much, their senses of self and self-worth from what they do or accomplish in the material layer of being. And, you know, what do we get? You know, we get this deeply inculcated fear and aversion to addressing these critical issues. So now I'm going to take us into the third area of discussion um, by asking the panelists to kind of answer this question um, or these questions. What does, oh, lost my place here. I want to get my question right. What does distorted or non-distorted masculinity really look like? And we've touched on that a bit already, but how can men begin extricating themselves from regressive programming and healing its attendant trauma? And maybe what are some actual immediate action steps that some of our viewers could take? Uh, James, what would you like to share about this? Excellent uh, points and questions, Marianne. Uh, I think that I, I can only really go by my own example and what I've observed in, in other males that I, I got to know real well is to, to recognize, you know, what our trigger points are. Uh, you talked about how your father or uh, your father who came back from the war uh, overcompensated, was so fearful of his boys getting injured that he, he overprotected them, that he, he didn't allow them to go into the, the auto shop and, and, and whatnot, because he was fearful of, of things happening to them. And I, I feel like it, in my case, what I've had to learn over time, and I'm still a work in progress, is the importance of, of recognizing what my trigger points are. And as much as possible to retain control and not lose control of a situation, of, of circumstances, and, and recognize, you know, the root. If, if I get overly triggered for some reason, and, and usually there's certain core list of things that kind of at times set me off, I, I have to recognize that this is unfinished business. It's, it's unhealed wounds it's it's could be overproductiveness like you talked about it could be feared it could be any number of things own inadequacies uh, like uh, you know just yesterday I I brought home the wrong sandwich you know to, to Kylie she's getting ready to go to work and you know doesn't have time to prepare a lunch meal for herself and I got the order wrong right and I, I just really beat myself up over it because, you know, my wife's going to go off to work and, and, and she doesn't have the right thing to eat now, right? And so that became a real, I started beating myself up over it. I mean, really in, in a self-loathing manner almost. And I, and I should have known. I mean, she was very understanding of me and she said, it's okay, don't worry about it. But I, I was just so upset at myself for not getting a very simple, I mean, I had one job to do, right? Bring home the sandwich, the right sandwich, and I couldn't do it. And so all these misgivings, all these issues, all these other things bubbled up in me where, you know, the self-flagellation came in, the inadequacy came in, the self-doubt crept in, right? Uh, because that can touch on all aspects of life. Well, if I'm inadequate in this regard, it's like, what other things am I inadequate in? And so we have to be able to work past that and say, okay, I, I'm going to learn from that mistake. I'm going to make other mistakes along the way. 
but the important thing is when we're presented with certain stimuli, let's say, how do we react to it? Do we react to it in this overly emotional sense? Like what we see with the cultural Marxist programming, and this is exacerbated by Hollywood, it's all putting out the same things. Uh, the schools, all the cultural Marxist instructors and indoctrination that goes on. And also, remember, now cultural Marxism is so embedded in our culture that there are so many matrix sentinels around us now, so many Agent Smiths that are just waiting to put you back in line, waiting to, to, to corrupt you and waiting to uh, jump at an opportunity to point out your, your, your failings and point out your inadequacies, right? So a lot of it has to do with, uh, with retaining self-control, not in, in a extreme overcompensating way, but, but to recognize that, you know, we, we are only human, we do make mistakes, and also, I think it's important that we hold ourselves to, to a higher moral standard in, in, in certain ways. General Patton always said that uh, moral courage is far more important and far more rare than physical courage. And, and what he meant by that was any soldier or Marine can be indoctrinated, drilled to charge a machine gun nest or to obey orders unquestioningly, even under fire. And he's saying that that's what all soldiers are trained to do. They're just trained to set aside any doubts of their own mortality, any fears and obey unquestioningly. And what Patton was saying was, there are times when you have to question these orders. There are times when you have to do things that require moral courage not just the physical courage of acting out the indoctrination and basic drill and programming, carrying out orders under fire, but doing things behind the scenes, making the right choice. And even though it may be unpopular and even though it may uh, make you look like, you know, like a, a, a crazy person or a nut or or, or an undesirable, let's say, there, there, there is definitely a difference, I feel. There's things that are intrinsically right and there's things that are intrinsically wrong. And accountability and moral courage is a big part of that. For, for example, how often have we seen now where someone is getting assaulted by someone else and the person doing the assaulting, they're there with their friends, the whole event's being videotaped, not once, not once does the, a friend and say, wait a minute, pal, what are you doing? What you're doing is wrong. Leave this person alone. I mean, what happened to the basic humanity, the basic compassion, the basic self-accountability, where why would you want to associate with someone who just hauls off and attacks people for no reason? Why would you want to associate yourself with something like that? And, and it, it goes back to what Bernard talked about. The, the There used to be this ritual uh, initiation and a manhood, which again has been distorted over time. Uh, when people want to go into a certain fraternity in college, they have to go through these what amount to hazing rituals, but they're really just various forms of hum humiliation. <laughs> like we need more of that. I mean, when we grow up with all of these traumas and all these, and, and then, you know, someone wants to join a frat house, but they have to go through this ritual humiliation first. Or, or just the, the nitpicking Mickey Mouse uh, obedience, the mindless obedience they have to submit to, uh, in depending on the circumstance, depending on, on the military um, uh, instructors one is exposed to. Uh, because I've spoken to a lot of people in the military, and they said that, well, it varies. You could have these really anal retentive uh, sergeants, NCOs, and, and officers that just are sadistic and just derive sadistic pleasure and, and humiliating you and making you do meaningless things, stacking rocks and unstacking them, you know, dumb things like that, just because they have that power over you, right? And, and again, it comes down to self-control. A healed, well-integrated, for the most part, per, part, person, even in a position of authority, they don't feel the need to do that. It's the, the difference that we talked about earlier where well, you see something, someone makes a comment or someone posts something on Facebook, you don't feel this compulsion to have to correct them 
you don't feel this compulsion to have to grandstand and look at me, I know things, I'm correcting this person, because that's just satisfying some unhealed part of ourselves. It's that reaction, that emotive reaction I talked about before uh, at the outset of answering this, this question of yours, and I hope I'm making sense, Marianne, that how we react to things, the emotional triggers, and, and some of them you talked about, you know, the parental aspect of it, that's, that's so key. Because like Bernard, I was always seeking consciously or unconsciously, uh, you know, to, to receive, you know, credit and uh, appreciation from my dad. My dad was a taciturn man. He came back from the Vietnam War, even more taciturn, right? He didn't talk much before that, <laughs> didn't talk much, really didn't talk much after that. He didn't talk about his war experiences. And all I wanted was to be appreciated, patted on the head, told that I'm good, told that I'm worthy. And, and to just give you one example of how you can be, I was so affected on one occasion because I didn't get that, um, you know, need met from my dad. I was in art class, this is seventh grade, and I wasn't very good, I'll be honest with you. The project on that given day was you take a Coke bottle. We're old enough to remember the classic Coke bottles, right? You take masking tape, you, you cut them in a little kind of oblong strips, and, and you cover the whole Coke bottle, and then you take varnish, and you lightly paint it so it looks like old-school Mediterranean leather kind of vessel, right? Well, I did that. And a lot of the people in class, theirs was a lot better than mine. I did the best I could. I brought it home, and, and I set it somewhere. Right, I, I think I, I was in a tool shed. I didn't even put it in the house, right? And and my dad said it's going to make him sound like an ogre, okay? And I don't really, I don't mean to do that because my dad was a very good man, but he just like all of us, we have our our, our issues and shortcomings. So I left my, you know, vessel there, and my dad said that's ugly. Get it out of here, right? And you know, I walked away so hurt to the point of just wishing all kinds of like calamities to befall him. Because at that moment, I did not get my needs met. I wasn't even trying to show it off. If anything, I was hiding it. I didn't even have it in the house, it was on the tool shed. But my dad was one of those handy work kind of guys and he was in a tool shed and it was there. He didn't want to see it, right? And so the point of relevance is just that alone could have such a scarring effect to the point where I still remember that. I still remember uh, that event. I've still had to process and work that, that out you know, through me. And what things have happened in my life that have caused an emotive knee-jerk reaction in me stemming just from that incident, let alone all these other incidents that have happened. So it's important to try to retain self-control recognize what's triggering us at the moment, let the feeling wash over us, and then evaluate afterwards in a more quiet setting and, and realize, okay, how can I handle that situation better? It takes self-reflection. It takes a lot of, you know, plugging in the vulnerability and fears because it is scary to delve in those directions. It's scary to look at our, our inadequacies, okay? We like to think that we like to strive for excellence in all things in life. But when we come up short in certain ways, we can be our own worst self-critic. And, and the problem is the hyperdimensional aspects that we all know about. That's when those archontic intrusive thoughts come in. Yes, you are a loser. You got the wrong sandwich. You should have brought in a schnitzel chicken, right? Not a grilled chicken. So those things can play on your mind. I'm 55, going to be 56 this year, right? I'm still a work in progress, folks. I'm not one of those people. I'm a guru. I'm here. I've got it all figured out. Not me. I'm still working at it, right? And so I hope I answered your question, Marianne, but, but it, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And it, it, it takes a lot of self-reflection. And 
we have to push through these, these, these are fears, essentially, we have to push through of inadequacy and, and, and whatnot. So we have to push through that and break through those barriers, but do it in a way where we're not overly emotive because this cultural Marxist programming is making everyone around us overly emotive. Hey, you're not standing on your space. You're too close to me, pal. You don't have your mask on, right? So everything now is heightened and the Hollywood, the corporate media, everything depicts these wounded, unhealed, traumatized males as, as the new norm and has been for some time. So what we have to do is like, for example, just yesterday, and I'll, I'll wrap it up because, because um, I know we have to get to, you know, this question, but yesterday when I went to the store and I came back with the wrong sandwich, I also did a bit of shopping, right? And and what happened was um, these two elderly women got in front of me. They didn't realize I was there. They got in front of me at the cash register line. And long story short, they were both so apologetic. I, I might have looked menacing because I had sun, dark sunglasses, you know, I had the hoodie on and stuff, you know. And I had to reassure them, no, no it's quite all right, ma'am. It's quite all right. No, no it's, it's quite all right. And, and so the cultural message that they got from Hollywood and the media and everything else, you know, people in hoodies and in dark glasses and, you know, have little skin color or whatever, they can be somewhat menacing. So, you know, how did I handle that situation? Okay. So that's what it comes down to. Um, but I, I must digress and, and, I, and I do have to leave our, our, our group here. And I, I think, each one of you for letting me take part in this. I just, you know, have schedules that I have to meet today uh, with, with my wife and family. So thank you so much uh, for letting me take part in this, I must say. Oh, thank you for being here, James. Your input's been remarkable. And thank you for very much for sharing your own personal experiences. And you pretty much nailed it. Um, all the different things you said are good, are, you know, fantastic, but it takes courage. You know, Bernard was talking about this. It takes courage. And what is courage? Being afraid and doing it anyway. Yes. It's not about being free of fear. It's about knowing you've got fear around it and stepping up to the plate anyway. So thank you so much. You enjoy you. your family. Tell Kylie and Connor hello and give them my love. <laughs> oh, well. See thank you, James. Bernard. Evie. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Evie, what would you like to add to all that? You know, what, what, what tips would you give to viewers, you know, um, in terms of things that can actually do starting yesterday? <laughs> yeah, well, I would say early education, role modeling, and true educational teaching that's not backed by um, agendas that have malevolent and Machiavellian mind control programming. Um, I mean, for example, growing up, um, I didn't learn any kind of um, communication skills, for example, or understand what it meant to communicate what I needed and what I felt. Um, and I would try to be sensitive to others, but I didn't have uh, training on, let's say, compassionate communication skills and also assertiveness in communication when you're dealing with um, perpetrators and abusers and um, basically abusive bullying people. So I was one of these passive people who, who got bullied around and got beat up and abused quite a bit. And even growing up as a teenager when um, we had intervention from social services because of a sister that um, tried to commit suicide and run away. You know, I mean, we had the whole nine yards of a dysfunctional family that even the social service person who was assigned our family that we got close to, um, he was a pedophile. And he knew that my dad was a pedophile and he basically confronted him on it and says, yeah, it takes one to know one. And so we, we were like double, uh, I don't know how to say it, traumatized from not only the abuse from the father figure, but the abuse from somebody who was placed in a social service agency who was also a pedophile and an alcoholic. So there was never any education in the school system or any system I was in that what, what is normal compassionate communication uh, what is, you know, assertiveness skills and what is okay and not okay. And like, what is abusive and not abusive. So I, 
I think people do not learn these things even in school today. Um, like even understanding complex post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of um, fight, flight, freeze, fawn are the four basic types of behaviors that we're triggered to to adapt to basically becoming numb so we could you know deal with the stress like over our lifetime. Usually when it's when you're a kid, right? You're raised from abuse onward, so you have to adapt one of those major styles. So even if people could be educated on knowing, you know, you're a primary like fight flight person and you're a primary freeze fawn dissociative codependent on, you know, are you aware of this? And so that we can adapt and change our behaviors and learn these things in school, if we're not learning them in our home, that we would have a protective measure to actually be appropriately educated, not with mind control programs that are run by elites and political agendas, which I think many of us are already aware of that's going on in the world now. And it's, and it's very um, sad because a lot of the people who are being used are the ones who have been, uh, let's say, discriminated against over time and have multi-generational wounding that is very valid from having been discriminated against. And then that's taken advantage of by Machiavelli and extremely intelligent demonic forces that are using them as patsies to cause harm and suffering to others because they have an axe to grind because they have unhealed wounds from multi-generational abuse. And if we had education of multi-generational abuse on all levels, including racism and sexual abuse in any culture and any religion, then we'd be less likely to be manipulated by the Machiavellian hybrid reptilian, whatever you want to call it, so that we don't have to go to war. And when they trigger us, like the classic narcissist, always trying to start a fight and create all this chaos, we're going to go gray rock. We like, we just don't respond. We don't give them the energy. We continue on and we, we you know, set boundaries. And we're able to do that as educated people who know better because we're able to like nip it in the bud when we see it's a problem. I mean, what I would like to see, I mean, I know I'm ranting on here is that if we could have the true uh, discernment on emotional and spiritual and intellectual levels to be able to, to nip it in the bud when, when you, you see someone as a child or a teenager or a young adult or whatever, and they're starting to display behaviors of psychopathy or narcissism or you know being a pedophile, that we're able to nip it in the bud immediately before that becomes a problem in your family, in your business, in your country, in your nation, in your politics. We nip it in the bud immediately because we have discernment. And true discernment, that is the question here, is that we want to have discernment. It requires ethics and it requires what I'm thinking is a type of spiritual, emotional quality of intelligence and wisdom that is able to crack the code of why we're being manipulated war after war after war and all these dysfunctional behaviors that we're able to crack the code because we really got it this time and that we could really get it as an entire race, an entire uh, humanity, actually the discernment quality. So, I mean, that, that's it to be educated really about it all. Well, thank you, Evie. Um, <clears throat> and education obviously is a huge factor in this. And the thing of it is, um, we're basically the ones that are going to have to see that that happens. I mean, it's not going to happen from within the system. And I don't mean just the three of us, but the four, I mean, those of us who can see and understand, you know, what you're talking about. And that's, you know, that, you know, that, that healing, you know, and, and, and the, of the ones doing this work, you know, healing so that we can start taking those kinds of steps in society or maybe a little bit out of society, I should say, <laughs> because we have to make this transition. This is not going to happen overnight. Um, but that's the kind of, thinking that when one is involved in self-mastery and self-work, shadow work, that we open ourselves to this kind of creative thinking. You know, so many people get locked in the whole, you know, going to make a better mousetrap kind of thing instead of, no, we have to start from scratch here. <laughs> you know, yes, we have to work with what we've got right now. We have to do that. We have to, but you know, start move, you know, being able to move beyond that. And that comes with that self-healing. So thanks very much for your input there, Evie. Bernard, what would you like to add? A lot. No, I, <laughs> I'm go, typing it. go for it, honey. <laughs> <laughs> no, excellent points made also by both uh, all of you guys and also James. 
too bad James already left because I'm still fantasizing about this schnitzel uh, chicken. <laughs> Because I'm really hungry. <laughs> I haven't eaten yet, so I can understand why. Yeah, because, stop it. <laughs> because schnitzel chicken definitely overrides grilled chicken in my view too. So anyway, but uh, <laughs> um, I can also uh, touching base uh, what what uh, touching on what James said. First of all, it's really also understanding the humility and the acceptance. It's we all works in progress, and similar like James, I'm 48 years old now. I first got into like diving down the matrix, whatever, but I was into self work since the 90s. I got into Jungian work in 96, 97, right? And then also over the years, I had my therapists, coaches, workshops, courses, self-education, and truly understanding, not only understanding about applying, and it's not going to resolve by next Tuesday, right? There are layers. And I've noticed, and you guys know this as well from working with clients in your own process, the psyche has its own healing timetable, you know? A lot of stuff cannot come out unless other stuff has been come to the surface and resolved first, right? It's a natural process we have no control over. And, you know, there's a paradox as well. It's almost like a free will and, and predestination, you know, and then the law of cause and effect karma comes in as well, what we're dealing with. So we need to get out, you know, it's very complex. It's multi, multi-dimensional levels. Then from a hyper-dimensional level, levels where we, they keep us entrapped as well. And the victim blame consciousness in particular, to externalize everything, right? Then on a, what Evie talked about on an ancestral level and all of that, it all comes together. And I realized that my own work, you know, especially in relationship, more stuff comes up. Now I'm married, I'm 48, and all of a sudden stuff comes out. I already have thought I resolved. Still stuff comes up for my first three years on this planet. <laughs> like, and it can be as little. That's what people understand. What James made an excellent example of what happened with this art piece, the Coke bottle. And is that like, get this, uh, uh, this, you know, ugly thing out of, out of my face, you know, which in the moment he didn't even meant it maybe that bad. He's just like, whatever, get us out of, you know, was not bad, but that can be very scarring. That's really can install that. I'm not good enough program. All of us have to varying degrees and shut yourself down. Like, fuck this suck. I cannot show myself anymore. That hurts. The world is not safe anymore. And that's why we keep ourselves enslaved on all levels, right? And then blame the outside world or project our shadow. Um, so it is having that patience and that humility that this is a work in process, right? And also understanding, and you guys noted as well, that it's highly individual process. While there are basic, we need to have a basic understanding of psychology and there's archetypes and certain quote unquote psychological rules. You know, it's also very specific because what works one may not work for another. And we have different areas to focus on, right? And Gurdjieff always said, you know, it's so important, self-work is so important, but before we can engage in self-work, we need to know how to do self-work. Hence, the psychological education, you know, on a very basic level, especially shadow work, it's so hyped and popular, this topic, but I still question if most people even understand it, let alone apply it, right? The understanding the nature of projection triggers and then shadow work itself has also become very, you know, oversimplified in new age pop spirituality with this over, you know, um, simplified saying, when you spot it, you got it. You know what I mean? So, you know, even though there's some truth to it, but it's not that black and white. So educate yourself, you know, you know, I know for myself, I like, I realize in my, I've mentioned many times before, I was suicidal in my twenties. I woke up in depression, you know, my life, like I didn't know where my life was going. I was doing drugs. My, my band wasn't going well. And I was, waking up in fetus position one morning crying. I didn't know, you know, even like calling my mom, even I remember, but then she on top, she doesn't know better. Like that's almost shaming me on top why I haven't gotten an education, like putting more salt in my wounds. So I couldn't get any help like from my parents, right? I had to, I realized that voice came into my head. You have to figure out yourself, otherwise you will die. And that uh, drive, when you're really sincere, I know it and, and want to work on yourself, want to heal yourself, then there are divine forces, there are positive forces that help you. Then magic appears, the hero's journey, right? Then the, the mentors appear out of nowhere, even though they're not official mentors, the guru appears, right? Or in forms of books and teachings, synchronistically, it will appear, it will help you, but the sincerity of really wanting to do it. That's what I noticed when Laura and I work together with people by myself, it's a huge difference. People just like, yeah, I want to try it out. I want to get into it versus people. No, I fucking, I'm going to have the sincerity to do it. I want, I want to dive in. And I've known people who have dealt with severe trauma who had more breakthroughs and 
truly heal themselves because of their sincerity as opposed to people who may have just like okay basic childhood wounding but are that very sincere but kind of like you know don't take responsibility but they don't come far in life right so it is about you know that education educating ourselves and also understanding i know for myself and you guys i'm sure can relate there's only so much self-work you can do on your own and laura and i mentioned that in our last podcast as well yes do self-work stuff but you all you cannot do everything by yourself it's impossible you have your you will lie to yourself you rationalize yourself you have your subjective blind spots you need to work with with, with another person or others i know this for myself so go seek help ask Find the right coach, therapist, I've, you know, or even just course, workshop, whatever it may be. I've done it all and invest in yourself. You know, for, that's, that's, that's what, what it comes down to. If you really want to go that route and have that sincerity because the only way out is in and through basically, right? And also what I also know, you know, we all have this, James talked about uh, the self-critic and I have this myself as well. And I'm dealing with all the trolls and attacks and people like criticizing my work, attacking me. They can do nothing more than I am already beating myself up on. (laughs) I'm a worst fucking critic. Like anytime I write something, like I'm just, you know, I also have similar what uh, what James said when some stuff happens here recently something I beat myself up I call myself stupid that's ridiculous you know this is the worst you can do this need to be rejected this is not your voice these are even like um, um, Evie made a very good point where are these thoughts coming to begin with right like it may be mothers father our ancestors but also hyperdimensionally augmented from other forces they feed into that they make it worse than it is they give us the voices you know jerry masinski's work i'm sure you guys heard about you know schizophrenia no we all schizophrenic in some level we all have this inner critic all the time which we also need to then shut the f up right this is not who i am so that's also then the warrior archetype so it's it's both and especially in this day and age, we, it, this is a time of war. We need to embody the warrior archetype, right? So that, that's very, very important. Speak out and speak up. And, and Marianne, you made a very good point. People think like it's about becoming fearless. No, there's always fear. I'm, I have my own fears. I know when I go deep in somatic meditation, I can even sense the fear in my body is stored. You know, it's just unconscious. And there's always fear unless you become completely enlightened, <laughs> you know, and transcend it all. Um, But the important is, like uh, Castaneda said, acknowledge your fear, but act despite the fear with courage. This is what we need to do, right? That's where courage comes in, in this day and age, not give in to the mob hive mind frequency, right? To give away your power. That's how the matrix truly works. But also what I recommend, you know, in a nutshell, it's very important, especially for men, to get out of here into the body the body holds the key so the somatic approach is so important find a body mind practice qigong yoga whatever i don't care whatever it may be but something the embodiment process and and i don't mean just working out that can also help you know to get in your body physically but it's also somatic work the emotions are stored feelings are stored in your body you know the muscle like wherever you hold tension there's actually emotions stored and we need to access them and it doesn't happen overnight it takes practice and consistency is key you know so that's that's very important and also what i can also highly recommend and i've learned a lot from my uh, partner laura because she's an astrologer she combines astrology evolutionary astrology with somatic psychology and it's so fascinating. I followed astrology for a long time and sometimes dismissed it because it's been also corrupted, distorted. It's like, you know, you know, over, you know, oversimplified. But there's a deep psychic truth. It's a deep psychic art, first of all. And it's an amazing map to understand your soul trajectory or even from a male perspective, understand your male and female energies or the elements and how they distribute it because everybody's different. If you know the Saturn placement, the lesson of Saturn, that's authority, that's father in your chart. Or Mars, it's, the, it's also the ego, the male aspect of consciousness. Or your nodes and all of that, that can give you also an understanding you know, of what you really need to work on and self-acceptance. Because that's what I've noticed. We, many of us, when we're insecure, we also automatically um, um, compare ourselves to others. And that's the worst you can do, right? Like, oh, what is he doing? She doing, I should do this and that. No, you need to find your own way and it needs to be very customized. So that can help as well. So there are many avenues 
uh, where we can really learn about yourself. And, and the most important part of learning yourself is having the self-acceptance. And then besides the psychology, because what I, what I also found in my own process, we can also, of just a pure psychological process, you always end up somewhere in, in childhood and your parents, you know what I mean? You can get stuck in the mud, you know, of digging in the mud all the, all the time, or even John ancestral and hyperdimensional and all these entities. But we need to also um, incorporate the spiritual work, right? To like, there's, there's the God, the vine, Christ consciousness, whatever you may want to call it. I'm not talking about something outside, but our divine nature, our essence to aspire to something higher. You know, that's what I'm big into Sri Aurobindo's work of integral yoga. And he called the process of the ascent and descent to go down into the unconscious, into hell, but bring down the light as well, right? And that no new age calling in any entities and whatnot, but there are divine forces. There's a divine as well, the light that can assist us. So we need to combine, uh, connect to both. It's very important, this holistic approach, because that's what I see the blind spot in the pure psychological work can also turn into paralysis analysis and constantly processing, you know, going shadow work, literally getting lost in the mud. And then the opposite side hand, that's a blind spot of the pure spiritual approach, which obviously we know turns into spiritual bypassing and not working on your basic uh, childhood stuff, for example. So we need, we need that holistic approach, but it really comes down, speaking to the audience, to your sincerity. Do you really, you know, like Adi Ashanti, I like his work sometimes too, uh, uh, not sometimes, I like his work a lot, but he made a good point. He said, especially in this day and age, a lot of people talk about awakening, but what they're actually saying, they want to be happy in their dream state. Because what does it mean to really awaken? What is your intention in life? Do you want to heal? You know what I mean? And there's no judgment, but it really comes down to your intention in life and what you're willing, how Gurdjieff would say, how sincerely are you willing to pay with yourself, right? With your sincerity. And not even monetary, even as well, in investing into yourself and what it may be. You know, like I, you know, I've invested way more money into myself, into my own self development and my healing than in any uh, um, material objects, literally, right? And that paid off way more than anything else. So these are questions you need to ask yourself before um, getting into work. Are you really willing to do the work? And that's, that summarizes my take. Right beautifully said and um and what you were just talking about uh i'll it's a good segue for me to uh touch on you know the few points that i wanted to make i have, have a, had a gazillion other things i wanted to say today and wish i had had time but um i'm going to as far as action steps uh you just opened that door for me beautifully bernard uh before we even jump into this or that work, unless you already know that. Um, I would say that maybe first and foremost, uh, to again, to the viewers, to men, you can choose to get off the fence in terms of your co-creational choices by making a sincere commitment to counterpoising what's going on right now, all these intensely regressive unfoldments we're seeing, in ways that serve to advance soul's evolution and progress rather than undermining it. You can ask yourself, what are you willing to do to honor and fulfill that commitment? You could ask yourself, um, you know, maybe make a list of the characteristics that you've been assigning to what it means to you to be a man. You know, make a list of those things, quick list, you know, a few short words. What does it mean to you to be a man? And then you can ask yourself where those ideas came from. Uh, did they come from your parents? Did they come from, you know, our guardians or other so-called authority figures, maybe teachers or coaches, uh, you know, religious figures, if you grew up in some sort of religion, religious background or spiritual background? Uh, did they come from your peers? Did they come from perhaps uh, ethnic or uh, other cultural ideologies? Did they come from social memes or stereotypes? Just really dig into that. Or did they come from your own inner knowing of the truth about what you really are? Um, what the mind-body complex really is and what it's for. And what you're really here to do. 
you know, the bigger, like Bernard was saying, the greater reality. What you're really here to do, and it goes way beyond being, and it, it's, it, it also encompasses being self-responsible at the material layer of being, but also at the psychological layer of being, at the energetic layer of being. You know, you have energy centers in your body. You're, you're accountable for that as, you know, non-nescient, self-aware, sentient beings we are accountable for every co-creational choice we make, you know, by way of the, you know, consciousness inbuilt perpetual balancing process. And it works through us. So, you know, getting your arms around what self-responsibility really is, you know, self-responsibility entails um, mastery of your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, uh, not suppression, but mastery using those co-creational energies to actually advance your progress. Um, learning to use emotions as key pointers to programming, you know, you know what, what you're feeling, checking in with the body when you are triggered, you know, sitting still, going into the body, you know, where am I feeling this? You know, what am I feeling? And being able to learn how there's steps you can take to learn how to use those feelings to track down <laughs> your programming, your wounding, all of those things. Um, another thing I would put out to viewers is to, and Bernard was touching on this as well, emotions. Oh my goodness. Women do this too. This, this, you know, cross generational, you know, collective either suppression you know emotional suppression and armoring are this just as distorted and harmful you know vomiting of emotions that we see a lot of it in you know um you know the social arena the social media arena but this and people think oh well i'm expressing myself well no that's very unhealthy expression and what are you putting back out to the universe what are you putting back out into the collective that feeds through and comes back around to you so Learning how to experience your emotions in the body as they come up ultimately. First, there's a lot of clearing and cleaning and getting down to these old, deep, buried emotions. But then you get to the point um, where you learn to start managing that on a day-to-day -day basis and what I call emotion hygiene. And then ultimately on, you know, a situation to situation or moment to moment basis and doing it in safe, responsible ways that don't, quote, pollute the collective. You know, it's just like throwing garbage in a river to not how to know how to safely. And it's also not good for the psyche or for you, but to not know how to safely and responsibly experience or transmute and ultimately release and dispense with emotions. So that's a biggie. Get some help with that if you need to, because that's one of the biggies for men. Um, you can ask yourself what your lines in the sand are when it comes, for example, to physical survival. In other words, you know, we're, we're in some really tricky times right now, and this isn't about doom and gloom. This is about self-responsibility being accountable. Um, in other words, if you found yourself in a potentially life-threatening situation, what would your top priority be? Would you be willing to sacrifice personal integrity and values and soul's progress in favor of physical survival above all else or not? Figure out your lines in the sand. And that's just one example. You know, coming to grips with dying. I hate to tell you this, but you're going to die at some point. So coming face to meeting death before it meets you, so to speak. Coming, you know, coming to grips with that. And you can ask yourself what you're willing to do when it comes to identifying, acknowledging, and releasing toxic programming and healing the trauma that's been tied to that, you know, owning that you have been subjected to it and that you can't always see it and you can't always do this by yourself. Um, 
for example, as Bernard made the key point, the are you willing to invest time, energy, and finances in yourself towards understanding and engaging in shadow and self-work and other self-mastery disciplines and so forth? And not about taking on someone else's programming, you know, their program, but like I know that for a fact that Bernard and I know Evie does too, um, as well as myself, the services and programs that we offer are all about facilitating you getting in tune with your own unique journey, your own unique embodiment process, your own unique way of attuning to and co-creationally aligning with your own unique purpose. So look for those kind of people when you're looking for assistance. You know, people that are attuned to helping you attune to you. <laughs> um, are you willing? Are you willing to take an honest look at the quality and nature of your personal and professional relationships, your home and work circumstances, and situations? And in light of the nature of the sticking points that I touched on earlier, are you willing to acknowledge um, that you likely have multiple blind spots? and could well be in need of some form of assistance in your self-work and self-mastery work and towards reclaiming self-responsibility. You can ask yourself uh, if you're willing to be open and vulnerable if you do choose to work with somebody. Um, because openness, candor, and vulnerability are critical. Um, and you can ask yourself if you're willing to step out of old comfort zones in order to make what could turn out to be significant, meaningful, long-term, positive changes in your life and in this reality. So self-inquiry could be maybe your very first starting point in all of this. If this is all new to you and you're ready to start taking responsibility for yourself, every aspect of yourself and your co-creational choices. So um, is there anything you guys would like to add to this before I wrap it up? No, I just actually wanted to make a point about really the value of doing the, the deep inquiry work and the uh, self-understanding and the healing that in, in hindsight, I would say even in my own life, and I'm sure maybe many others that we cannot appropriately mm, prepare for difficulties in life or even what's coming or like prepping for example until we have enough uh, deep self-understanding and healing and awareness so that we could actually tap into the spontaneous wisdom that is within us as a divine woman or masculine doesn't matter is that um, we actually can make better decisions in the moment when we have those deep understandings of healing um, because there's no amount of pre preparation that you could do when you're not in touch with that core and that I think we, we spin our wheels trying to do things on the external with money or jobs or even physical prepping and then then we don't have the self intuition to know at any moment what, what the Holy Spirit is telling us or what our spirit is telling us so really um, I found that the most valuable thing is self-understanding and awareness and, and the humility and the willingness to go deeper. And also what um, Bernard said, and you, know, you said too, is really we actually need to do this actually with others because we have our own blind spots. We can only do so much alone until we really need to take the step to be willing to work with someone else or actually work within a group, I find is very helpful mm -hmm. because we need each other to reflect upon what our own blind spots and behaviors are and that working with one another helps us uh, mutually support each other as well. So yeah. really that, that's it for me. Um, well, I love that point that you made and it's so critical, critical. You can prepare all day long and for days and weeks and months at the material level, level of being, but the most, the, the wisest thing you can do is to clear enough space, so to speak, clear enough, you know, do enough self work and clearing work and shadow work and all of that, you know, self mastery practices and to open yourself more to the highest possible wisdom, the intuition, core, you know, core self, I call it essence layer of being wisdom 
so that you're able to attune to that will, divine will. Divine will has knows what's going on. The more we get into the flow of that, the more smoothly our lives can flow. And I don't mean in terms of not having challenges, but the grace with which we're able to meet those challenges, the, the intuition, the wisdom with which we're able to meet those challenges. So uh, excellent points, Evie. Bernard, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, um, just to also confirm what Evie especially said, you know, I can also I definitely don't underestimate a group process. You know, that's what no. I found. I've, you know, hosted already, like that's not going to happen anytime soon, but I've done seven retreats down in, in Peru. No, we're not working with ayahuasca. It's just embodiment work. <laughs> like the moment I mentioned Peru, people are like, oh, you do medicine? No. <laughs> that's a whole other can of worms. Um, or like uh, recently, Laura and I had an online course. We're going to have future online courses, but within the group, there's some magic happens because there's almost like, um, I call it the positive form of trigger because when one person shares more vulnerable their story, it triggers in a positive way. Oh, I, I'm not alone. This person is dealing with the same thing. It creates a lot of compassion, empathy, and, and people are more encouraged and to share as well. And it really like some magic happens in the group that facilitates or uh, almost, uh, you know, not speeds up, but kind of like embraces a deeper healing process for all involved. Right. And even people ask questions, but another person wanted to ask, and I have to see myself in my, when I uh, participate in groups and all of that. So there's magic happening on that level. Another thing I want to mention, what um, you've always uh, also said, it's, you know, this whole idea, it's easier said than done sometimes, or just trust your intuition, trust your feelings. No, you cannot always trust your feelings. And intuition is also, intuition, the word intuition is as much as, much abuse as the word love and God, I feel. <laughs> Because people like, even the truth, you know, I, I don't resonate with this, I don't resonate, it's intuitively something feels off. And enough for myself, and I consider myself fairly embodied, I still have to learn to learn, that my so-called intuition was off. Then it, was, it wasn't off, but it was not my intuition. But I mistook all kinds of emotional infatuation, wishful thinking, my biases, all kinds of feelings for intuition, right? And there's even this, this saying like, oh, just take what resonates and leave the rest, which can also be completely abused, especially in certain spiritual teachings, you know, or, or more deep esoteric teachings, because you may just resonate with, it still gives you comfort and dismiss where you need to go, but it's hard work and it's painful, right? So it's very tricky, all of that. You need to come right to a certain level of what Evie said, self-understanding and healing and embodiment to really tune into your true intuition and the divine and all of it and takes work. And that ties also into another thing. Many of us, and I'm not taking myself out of the equation, I have this experience in my life as well. We need to uh, become clear about our needs. What are our true needs? Sometimes we don't really know what we need, right? Hence, we need some uh, conscious mirroring, some feedback on all of that to, you know, to pierce through all these buffers and defense mechanisms right and um being able to even to state our needs so that's 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 a process on itself so you know don't underestimate the stages in this process but it really what we all talked about it really comes to the intention and the sincerity that's the foundation of it all exactly and um it really is it does boil down to what you just said it's a matter of whether you choose to begin this process or not, or to, you know, maybe find means of advancing your efforts. If you're feeling stuck, you know, maybe you've hit a plateau. That can happen too. It happens all along the way. I mean, there's, this isn't just, uh, as Bernard mentioned earlier, this isn't just an up, constant spiral up uh, or, or linear climb upwards. There's up, there's down, there's, you have to go, you know, the further down you go, the higher up you're able to go, but you have to go down and it spirals and it zigzags. And sometimes it's three steps forward and two steps back, two steps back. So it does really just boil down to a matter of you choosing since uh, making a sincere commitment to this work, to extricating yourself from programming and healing trauma. And, and that's a choice that you and you alone have to make. And that's what it boils down to. And it does take courage. It does. This hasn't been easy for any of us. There's no one here. And James either. There's nothing easy about this. But I can assure you, this is also not about thinking you have to be 
at some milestone point, some imagined milestone along the way, to start seeing results. You know, this with this sincere intention, sometimes it's remarkable how quickly you can make progress. Um, you know, so don't think that this is, again, like Bernard says, it's not black or white. It's not, you know, and sometimes it may take some of us longer to build momentum. And groups are excellent for that. That's the word I ca that come, came to mind when you guys were talking about group work is momentum and depth. And when you have momentum and depth, then everybody tends to advance and advance in ways that many wouldn't have expected to advance. As, you know, and one-on-one work is one on work is beautiful and it's there's times for that where it's really needed but group work is it is it is magical it really is it's sort of a its own it's its own animal so thank you guys so much and thanks to you james for uh taking the time out to share your insights wisdom and knowledge and uh i just deeply appreciate appreciate it and thank you from the bottom of my heart um, once again, um, if you, I want you to mention your websites um, and tell me about um, anything, you know, any services or programs or projects you're working on. I'll speak for James for just a minute. Um, his website link will be posted below the video, uh, the Cosmic Switchboard, switchboard.com. And he has amazing information on his website. Um, a lot of videos and commentaries and interviews and so forth. And he also offers uh, consultative services for those of you uh, who have had various, um, perhaps maybe alien or my lab experiences and so forth. He's, he's just brilliant in that. So that's for James. <laughs> Evie? Well, my website is evilorgan.com, um, also alienlovebite.com. I do private consultations with um, all, all forms of anomalous trauma including narcissistic abuse. And every couple seasons, I also do a group, um, sometimes with Laura Leon. We do groups for anomalous trauma or different things so that I think groups are great. I think people can do so much and gain so much from groups. So I'm really a strong supporter of group work. So, and um, that's, so that's what I'm doing. And I'm available for sessions and you can find me on my website or uh, the Facebook Alien Love Bite page. Thanks, Evie. Um, Bernard. Yeah, again, my website is veiloftreality.com, V-E-I-L of reality.com. And um, yeah, many, there are many offerings. There's a lot of content on my website, videos, yeah. um, you know, already other webinars and um, articles, films I made and all of that. There's a membership section. People can sign up to have access to the second hour of our podcast I do with my wife and guests and also access to a membership forum where you can already share, you know, or, it's online. It's very limited still, you know, when you're on the forum, but it's better interacting than on social media usually. Oh, yes. <laughs> For obvious reasons. <laughs> then I offer also one-on-one -on -one sessions. You know, there's, I offer something called holistic coaching, giving more like, you know, the holistic approach of approaching all areas in life or within yourself. And I work very intuitively giving feedback and also customize it, giving, you know, practical advice and quote-unquote homework. So to empower yourself. But also moving more towards my wife, Laura and I, we're starting to create another online course. We did one in last or April called Occult Trauma, um, Shadow Work and Occult Forces. So combining all that topic together, and we're going to expand on that. We are creating also a new course platform and it will be more uh, exclusive offerings for very small groups. Right. And then maybe like also for more bigger groups. And the upcoming program will be eight weeks. And if you want to hear more about it, just sign up to my website, at least to the mailing list, and we will, you'll be notified about all future offerings. So, you know, that's that. Excellent. Beautiful. Thanks, Bernard. And as I said, the, all of the links to everybody's sites will be included below the video, wherever you find it posted. <laughs> You're going to probably find it in multiple places. But um, my, my website is restoration-activationproject.com and I also offer holistic coaching services around self the, the self-mastery process and there's a lot of information about that on my website and um, it's in, intuition guided and 
what I'm offering now, I'm offering a, a new weekly group coaching program that will provide ongoing holistic support for sincere self-mastery and embodiment aspirants. Um, because it takes time to get a little, to get stabilized in this work. It's ongoing. And if you're, you know, this will be, it's going to, it's designed for, to accommodate those uh, if you're just getting started on your awakening journey or if you're a seasoned trekker. But um, in addition to live weekly training in a wide range of tools and processes that help you facilitate your progress, um, <clears throat> you will also receive a free copy of my Self Mastery Guidebook, free access to a recording and PDF version of my Conscious Interaction webinar, and a steep discount on any private coaching sessions uh, should you desire that you need one-on-one -on -one support and training at some point. And I've made this program <laughs> extremely accessible, even to those with who might have the tiniest of budgets right now. Um, and I invite you to click on my website link below and you'll be taken to the homepage of my website. And when you get there, you can click on at the top of the page, you'll see the red progressive co-creation network link to get all the program details. In other words, okay, there'll be high interaction between participants, you know, uh, facilitated group discussions as well as training, the whole group thing, you know, building your network of, of fellow aspirants for support in ways that Bernard said, I mean, it's just, and, and Evie, it's just magical group work. It's magical. So thank you again to James, Bernard, and Evie, dear people, for joining me in this. And until next time, I wish all of you the best on your unique journeys during these challenging but exciting times. Bye for now. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Eve. Bye. Oh,